call the board meeting back to order um, and continue on with the agenda. We're on agenda item number six, uh, which is the chair's report. So there, I'm going to try to oh, my back. cut this a little bit short because I do have uh, a longer report this time. But I just want to point out a couple things that have happened since the last uh, board meeting. Of course, our committees continue to work on policy issues with staff about pending regulations. Um, our vice chair and assistant executive officer were at the CCA convention. They gave a presentation on ethics and law. And we also had a, uh, an opportunity in the exhibitor hall to answer questions for licensees and pass out literature. Uh, hopefully you remember that I was at the FCLB district meeting in September. This was the district meeting for District 4 and District 1. Um, if you guys look in your folders, I uh, prepared a written report for everybody. So you can look over that at your leisure. I put a little bit more detail into it, um, mostly for um, newer members who aren't familiar with FCLB. The one thing I did neglect to say is FCLB is the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards, Dr. Gordon. But so I outlined what district four, who comprises district four, who comprises district one. And I just want to point out a couple things that I think board members may be interested in. Um, you can read the rest of it on your own. Um, a couple of things that I found really interesting is Oregon has, a, um, has the freedom to change their mandatory hours every year depending on what's necessary or current that they feel, um, and one of the things that they did this year is they made each chiropractor take the concussion class online given by the CDC. It's a free online webinar. I took it to see what it was all about. I put a little, at the, the very last page in your handout is a screenshot of some information about the concussion class. I thought it was very useful, and I think it's a good idea um, to have the CD committee possibly discuss our ability to do, do something like that, be more nimble about, about mandatory hours that are more applicable to what's happening currently. So I wanted to point that out. And feel free to check out the CDC webinar. It's easy to access, and I thought it was really good. Um, I'm going to skip through a bunch of this other stuff. We got an FCLB update, um, I explained what SINBAD, which is the Chiropractic Information Network and Bureau, our Board Action Data Bank, and it, it, lit, it will compile disciplinary actions that happen across the state and all the member boards for FCLB, you can read about that. Um, nothing much has changed with PACE, but there's some information about PACE for you guys. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the very last item on the page, which may be an interest to people. FCLB is putting together a specialty task force. So they're trying to answer questions like, you know, who can call themselves a specialist? How do you vet specialists? Their goal is to specify what training and testing is necessary. And I thought that some board members might be interested in participating with that. Um, Dr. Taze, and then I got some additional information after I typed this up. Dr. Kirk Schultz is also someone you can contact, um, and if you would like his email address, I can provide it. Um, there are some openings in the FCLB that are listed there and how you can do that. And then the last bit of this report I want to talk about is about the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners, because they've had quite a few changes. They are relaunching their computer-based testing starting in January of next year. Um, there's been some changes to part one and part two of boards. They have been modified to reflect the latest psychometric practices that the board has determined, uh, the national board. They've changed the exams. They're a little bit shorter. They're 300 questions now. And instead of getting six scores for part one and part two, they'll get just one score, and if you uh, don't have a passing score, they can, they'll break it down for you in what area you didn't pass in. So there's been some changes also to part four. They've gone to digital diagnostic imaging. If you've ever been a part four examiner, you'll know that x-rays were up, and that and the, well, if you took part four. Students went from section to, examinees went from 
um, section to section looking at the x-rays. So they're not going to go from section to section. It will be digital. They'll get two minutes instead of four minutes per station. Um, and they'll increase the number of images from 10 to 20, which I think is great. Um, the next page talks about some of the services that the national, that NBCE provides. They provide your cruise tests at no cost to states, if that's something they're interested in. We know about the spec exam. Um, we know about the EVAS exam because we use that. And then there's some information at the very end of this, this flyer. It's just about a, another part of this report called um, CCCA, which is Certified Chiropractic Clinical Assistance. Some, some states require chiropractic assistance to be certified, um, and there's some information about what FCLB does for that. So this report is fairly com it's complete about you know, the things we talked about. I'm open to questions now or later uh, when you have time to read over the report. Any questions right now? Okay. And then finally, um, later on in our agenda, we are going to be accepting nominations for new board officers. And uh, I, I was inspired. I watched Gavin Newsom's acceptance speech on Tuesday. And I was inspired by some of his words that I wanted to share with the board. In his speech, our governor-elect said, now is the time for decency, for facts, for trust, and now is the time for truth. Now is the time to know that polarization is not permanent. As Californians, we don't demean, we don't discriminate, and we don't demoralize. I found those words inspiring, and I hope the board can find them inspired, inspiring too. I do have one question. Yeah. Um, you just for point of record, does the Board of Chiropractic Examiners also oversee the chiropractic assistants? We don't require chiropractic assistants to be certified. We don't oversee chiropractic assistants. Okay. Let's move on to item number seven, approval of the June 5th, 2018 board minutes. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept and approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? I would like to um, just um, get some clarification regarding changes to that were not put on this um, draft here that was discussed previously, particularly regarding comments that were reflected as or, or reflected as being from me that were still not updated, um, not accurate. I don't know if those were we should have them left off or it wasn't a purposeful labor vote and not a mistake. We can make those changes and um, bring them back at the next meeting. I I would um, definitely request that that be done. So can you point them out so that we know which ones need to be you guys will need so to know which ones right? I think for the record we have them. You have them? Yeah. Okay. They were um, discussed previously, but if you'd like to go through them, if you have them for your markets, I think you do. Okay. Yeah, we, we have them. I, I don't know why they didn't make it in here. I apologize for that. So can we amend the motion to approve these on our next? We'll, we'll need to see the minutes again and approve them at the next board meeting. Or we could, could we just mail it out? Oh, oh can I have to step out. Um, I think we can just um, defer. We, well, we can just make the changes and um, mail them out to the board members and probably do a mail vote. All right, so why don't, why don't I just withdraw the motion? Okay, yeah, and we, let's come back to that. I'll okay. have to ask Ken. We'll withdraw that motion okay. and wait for the corrections. Um, one other part of correction. If I may, um, on page 10, it's just a small correction, however significant in my opinion. It says Mr. McLean called the board's attention to the page last I checked. That was incorrect. What would you like changed? Um, approximately one, two, 
Not sure. It's right there. Um, it's page seven, almost on the third paragraph from the bottom. Last board meeting in order to have Dr. Gordon's input on the process, but unfortunately, Mr. Rafino was not in attendance. So I guess it's at the last board meeting, right? At this particular meeting? Yeah. Um, yeah, at the August meeting. Yeah. At the August meeting, he wasn't there. Okay. So you just want so clarification about what meeting he wasn't meeting? at? Uh -huh. Okay. Because it's not clear for historical reference. On that same note, um, Dr. Gordon, or do you have one? That was it. On that same note on page four, where one, two, three, four, five, about seven sentences down, where it speaks of Mr. Julio acknowledging that staff, um, the data should be available by the next board meeting. Should we, um, for clarification, put the next board meeting on November 8th? Well, we can clarify. Let's just, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll put the date in there. Any other discussion? So I have a quick, um, quick question, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Just a pro procedural question. So since I was not there and reading at the minutes, I have questions about some of the content. Would that be appropriate to do it? At what point would that be appropriate for me to ask further clarification on some of these issues? Um, well, I guess now would be a good well, issue. Can we do it maybe, because um, some of the issue may come up in discussion later, mm -hmm. and they may clarify itself. Mm -hmm. can, would that be okay to go back to some of this uh, before adjournment? That means we would need to postpone. Do you have that is not a change in the minutes. It's not a change it's in the minutes. Okay. Sure. Within sure. The minutes. Yeah, we can do that. Let me just make sure I add it to the end of the agenda so we don't forget to go back to it. Um, another question, I mean, this is just, I'm not sure if it's possible, but it's helpful. Like, as I, as I was reading this minutes, uh, there's public comments made and different people, and it would be nice to know who they are. Like, for example, you know, Dr. Kendra Holloway, I think she represents one of the schools, right? But I was not sure. Maybe if we can, there were several distances that I did not recognize. Who, you know, who are they, or that sort of thing. Maybe if we can add that, that yeah. might be helpful for Something. people that are reading, whether it's online or whether it's in. Where's Kendra well, mentioned? We could ask. Can you, what, what page and is that, as, is Dr. Holloway mentioned on? Well, just for example, I'm using hers. I think there's two or three places. In, uh, page 18, uh, for example, it says public comment, but it, uh, yeah. Dr. Kendra Holloway. Yeah, but I was trying to figure out who, you know, who she well, was. I guess, yeah, in that particular instance, um, I think Dr. Holloway was representing herself because she used to work for one of the colleges but no longer does. Sure, but I think it's worthy to have people identify themselves not only by name, but if they are representing a college and organization. We do, like um, every other instance they do that. On page yes. six it is listed so with their name and who they are. Yeah. Yeah. So if they're just private, I it, it yes. is not. <laughs> Any other discussion? 
discussion? For those instances where, there, where it is just a, a, a doctor who's in private practice, um, would it be um, possible to just put private practice, the doctor in private practice, or something to just distinguish that it wasn't left off? Yeah, it's just, just, yeah that's noteworthy. Yeah. I think on page six is a good example of how that is done. Like Dr. Brian Stensler, California Chiropractic Association, they listed when they had it. Right. But I'm just saying for people who are not affiliated with anything yeah. so that other people reading the minutes or whatever for your future reference mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Call for the vote. Azalino, yes. Dane? Yes. And Lickman? Yes. And McLean? Yes. Rufino? Abstain. Abstain. Okay, Rufino abstains. And Gordon? Yes. Move on to item number nine, which is ratification of approved ratification of approval of license applications. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve license applications. Uh, I'll second it. Any discussion? Any public comment? I'll call for the vote. Azalino, yes. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. And Gordon? Yes. Item number 10, ratification of denied license applications in which the applicant did not request a hearing. I don't think there are any. Number 11, ratification of approved continuing education providers. Motion to approve continuing education providers. I'll second. Any discussion? What's our timeline for um, the new CE requirements? that we are working on regulatory language and working with stakeholders still. I mean, every, every meeting we have seems to bring up more things we want to um, tweak in the CE regulations. So it is in process. Is um, there? Yes? No, Natalie, come on. Is there something we can do in the meantime to adopt some things so we have a little greater clarity on uh, the substance of these classes? You want to do something separately just for the CE provider application? Yes. Um, well, I think it's going to take the same. It's going to take still going the, through the regulatory process. And then. Even if we add a line to uh, a couple lines to have them describe what the. Uh, their classes uh, or what they plan on teaching? So you're talking about taking the existing regulation. This is part of a bigger regulation. Mm -hmm. Take that section out, add a few lines to it, and try to get it through the, the regulatory process. How feasible is that, Marcus? Otherwise, we're shelving everything because we're trying to approve the greater I mean, change. Can, I mean, we can do it. It's just. I, my concern is. Um, for the providers, I don't know that, um, I mean, I guess we can do it if this is what the board wants to do, but the provider doesn't necessarily have to um, provide a specific course or type of course. They, you know, for instance, um, the associations are approved providers in, this, in the chiropractic colleges, so, you know, for them to describe um, the types of courses colleges in particular would have to just describe well, um, their whole uh, catalog. Um, I'm more concerned about the individual providers rather than the colleges or the association. And so, you know, as it sits right now, we have individuals that we're approving, but we have no idea what they plan on teaching. Do you have a comment? They know what they plan on teaching. That's what we discussed last time, yeah. that we're so um, dismayed with just not having any additional information that I agree. Um, that there needs to be 
if we could, could maybe do something to separate or something so that we can address this issue so that we can halt continuing to just um, approve of these things without all the additional information that we've discussed in committee and, and talked about that it's necessary to really vet these people. The CCA, for instance, and Don can speak on this behalf um, before even if it's just for a, uh, you know, a nighttime meeting, a district meeting, you have to submit the lecture that you're going to be presenting at least, a, is it a month ahead of time? But I think but, you're confusing but that's the course outline with a yeah. CE provider. I'm, I'm sorry, and let's, sure. uh, can we take a, a second? A couple Dixie, of clarifications. Um, both the provider app and the course application are incorporated by reference into our regs. So any changes to those apps would have to go through the regulatory process. And secondly, because they are two different apps, they are um, they are reviewed separately. So they have to become a provider first and be ratified by the board before they can even submit a course app. So they are done separately and independently of each other. Okay. Um, I, um, Lori, do you mind if I ask you a question? Um, are you approved by any other regulatory entities? Um, and do uh, when you apply to be a provider, do they um, do they ask for substantive inf information about the courses you teach, or or is it just your credentials as somebody who is teaching? Yeah, and see, the thing is, because when once they've been approved as a provider, and we do plan to, when we uh, revise the regs, ask uh, for more information uh, from the providers to uh, to substantiate that that they have the ability to, you know, that um, they, they have the resources in place to pr provide quality CE. But then when it comes to the actual courses, before they offer the course, it has to be submitted to us for approval. And there, um, Natalie, who's our um, CE coordinator, Natalie Boyer, and she's sitting here, um, she gets all of the applications from all of the providers and then reviews them for consistency with our regulations. And we do, if something doesn't, you know, there's something of concern or something doesn't meet the regulation requirements, um, Natalie will deny it. Um, so that's how we address um, any issues with the course at this point. And once the regs change and we have, um, if we have different laws and different requirements for the uh, courses, then our review will change based on the new law. So I, I'm just trying to see if there's something we could get through in the interim of, I guess obviously we're getting a lot of pushback on the changes that we're trying to implement, and is there something that will suffice just to at least um, give us a better idea on who we're providing, you know, credit to and what their what their substance is of the course? Um, we we are we do plan to tighten up the the requirements for courses. We um, we want to right now. There's a lot of um, it's one package right now. Yeah. Right now, so the one thing gets stalled, the entire thing that's is getting that's stalled. That's and I think specifically who you're speaking to, we'd like more information on the providers. So if you're asking specifically if we can, in lieu of waiting until this package is completed, if you would like us to pull off the provider application specifically to make changes that would, that would require people applying to be a provider to provide additional information. Is that specifically what you're asking if we can do? Partially that and partially more about their course that they're providing. Okay, so, so yes. Those are, those are two, two different things. Separate. Yeah. So I think if you, the, the first part about the application, if that's something that you want us to consider, I think that's a more reasonable thing that we can do. However, making piecemeal of the actual changes to course any course application, anything related to the courses, I think that's a little bit more problematic and it'll be difficult for us to do that. That's just my opinion. So I think if you, if the provider application, if you would, if you would feel a little bit more comfortable if we got more information about the CE providers and when you're ratifying it, you could have more information to consider before you approve them. I think that's something that we can reasonably do. Yeah, I understand you wouldn't necessarily here. know at the time of approving the provider, of approving the I'm provider, the you wouldn't know anything about their courses or, um, you know, unless. Sure, but as it sits right now, as a board, the only thing that we have is a list of names and we're either approving them all or ratifying them all or we're not and we don't have any further background or anything of the sort. And uh, please, I'd like to hear on behalf of the other board members what they feel. So 
so I have a couple of things to consider. Um, number one, we can certainly, if Dr. McLean agrees, um, agenda as part of this committee meeting and see what might be possible for us to do. Uh, but the other thing that I would I'd be concerned with is we have this new CE provider application going through the reg process, and meanwhile, we finish the continuing education regulation as a whole, which will inevitably make further changes to the CE regulation, to the CE provider application. And so they're both going through at the same time. I mean, I guess we could pull the first one if that were to happen, but that's just something that that's something that could you can work on them simultaneously. Um, so and if and if if the second one starts going through when the first one is, it may need to get pulled anyway. But um, I think that if Dr. McLean is the chair of this committee, uh, so chooses, we can put this on the agenda for our next committee meeting. I have no problem absolutely with putting it on the agenda. If we look back at the last meeting, um, not of the last board meeting, this is one of the things that I um, brought up as far as having um, a lot of, uh, of discomfort with just approving these lists the way they are anyway. So I'm all for let's just discussing how we can at least um, sure up this application so that we're not just getting a name and sometimes not even a, a name of a person per se, but a name, of alphabets, uh, an acronym, or whatever. I absolutely agree. We need to do more um, vetting I, with that. I think we all agree on that. I think the question is, are we going to split this off and start working on something immediately split it off from this the larger CE regulation that we're working on. Well, I think the I question think there is, okay. yeah, the, I don't think the question is if we want to, it's yeah. a, if it is possible, if it will if expedite possible, getting I mean, something through. If it's possible, then if it's possible, I think we should. Okay. If it's going to expedite getting something through, otherwise, you know, right. we're, we're holding out for the, the greater so, um So here's what will need to happen if we want this to happen quickly, like if the board wants to take action at the mes next meeting, the licensing and CE committee will need to meet um, maybe more than once and determine or come up with a recommendation of for what they want, what information they want to receive from providers um, when we're, we've received the applications and are approving providers. Um, so if the licensing CE committee is able to come up with a recommended language that we can put into reg and a recommended um, application, they can present it to the full board at the January meeting. If the full board votes to adopt it, start the rulemaking process, we can do that. Um, we'll have to put it out for notice it with OAL, put it out for a 45-day notice, and then go through all the other steps. We're probably looking at, in a perfect world, um, nine months or so um, at a minimum for that to take effect. In the meantime, we're diverting that attention away from the bigger of uh, CE applications. So it's, why are we it's, diverting the attention away? Why can't we do it simultaneously? We can, but we can, but there's, but if the the licensing CE committee is working on, if they're focusing their effort on just the provider, then the other issues in the CE package will probably take a back seat until we get that moving. And well, then, can we put another person on the committee so that we get more work done? In the interim, um, and enlighten me if I'm wrong, is this the entire application that they need to fill out? This is pursuant to the existing law, and that's, and that's the thing, we can't change that because it's adopted into the okay. regulations. But I understand that's where, you know, part of our, well, at least my being uneasy with this is we don't know if they've even taught a course before. Um, we don't know, you know, anything uh, about what their past is, and so that certainly would be nice, and I find that a little hard-pressed to understand in regards to them wanting to teach a course if they don't have a history and I don't know why we can't have one line in there about um, at least providing what previous courses they've taught. Well the, the thing is the provider isn't necessarily teaching a course and when we approve the course we do um, receive the CVs for any of the provider the instructors uh, so the the provider may be may not be a teacher, may not be a, um, a chiropractor, um, the provider 
can be any entity or person, and they're not necessarily the expert that's teaching the course. They, they may just be the, the person running the, you know, the school or whatever. So the qualifications for the actual instructors for a CE class is regulated through the approval process for the CE class itself. And it, it would be, uh, you know, I think it would be problematic to, to require the providers to have any particular expertise in, in chiropractic or in you know, Why is that teaching. problematic? Uh, because they're not necessarily teaching. They're, you know, like the, um, it's not a good example, but Life West is an approved provider. Um, but they're, they're also a degree-granting institution yeah, that's and already received appropriate vetting through the CCA they have, and whatnot. Yeah, so. and CCA is an approved provider. DCNLI. Um, DC there's, yeah, and there's other um, okay. just general um, entities that provide CE for different professions. And <laughs> All right, well, we don't need to belabor this issue, but we do definitely need to clean this up. Well, I think, if, but if this is a priority, I think we should determine today what we want the next action to be so we can do that because otherwise we'll be having this conversation again at the next meeting and nothing will have changed. Well, I think the chair of the committee agrees that we need to take some action I think Mr. Rufino has a comment here. Mr. Rufino. Uh, <clears throat> procedurally, I was going to suggest, well, first of all, procedurally, I would draw the motion to approve. And then, um, I'm not sure if, I, if it's in order, but I would move to uh, direct this to the committee at their next uh, committee meeting to discuss it and bring back that that will result in effectively denying all of these providers, and they won't be able to um, offer their courses. Uh, yeah, they, they won't be able to submit any courses for approval, review, and approval because they're not an approved provider. My concern there would be that the existing regulation does not require any criteria to be met, and by not ratifying the approval of these providers you are in essence applying criteria that have not been adopted in order to deny it. And I think that... Um, well, I'll make a motion to approve this here. I have no problem moving forward with this here. I wouldn't say I have no problem, but I understand your concern and we can't apply a future uh, criteria that we want to existing situation. So I'll make a I motion second. to approve these. We have a second? I second. Can we call for the vote on this and then we can discuss the... Yes. Second part of Aslino, yes. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. And Gordon? Yes. Sir. Now, as far as deciding what the next action steps are going to be, is the board comfortable with Dr. McLean leading this question further at the next CE committee meeting? Yes, and we're going to need a motion to that effect, correct? To refer this to committee and uh, have a committee investigate what can be done to expedite some regulatory change? It can be made in the form of a motion directing the committee to study the issue. So I'll make that motion. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Any more discussion? Call for the vote. Uh, pub, I guess I should ask for public comment. Public comment. Aslino, yes. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Thank you. Item number 12, election of board officers for 2019. The board will initiate nomination procedures for board officer positions. Chair, vice chair, and secretary. Board members can either self-nominate or nominate other members. Voting will take place at the first meeting in 2019. after today, so thereby, or does it, does I it see Marcus saying it doesn't, no. it doesn't. okay, yes. just, just clarify. And the second clarification question, if somebody, whether it's self-nominated or uh, nominated by a board member, 
do, do we require that they accept the consent to serve before they can be placed in the I, I believe that was the intent. Yeah, yeah. Of doing it. I would think okay. that would be yeah. a must. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nominations are going to occur in roll call order with the chair nominating last. So um, Dr. Azalina will go through the order that's listed here in our notes and you can self-nominate or nominate another board member for any of the positions. So are you choosing, uh, obviously we're going to choose one position first and go through the entire role, or what is the best thing to do here, Mr. Swenson? We can do it either way. You can either yes. pick, oh, At the option better. and the discretion of the chair, each method has its advantages, but because of the concern previously expressed about how the slates work last time, it may make some sense to go through the nominations um, for each of the... To, rather than individually for each office to do it so that um, there's some understanding of what various nominations will be by each board. Agreed. So my, we're going to go through the roll call order for each office. First will be president, chair, then vice chair, then, then secretary. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Everybody in agreement with that? I'd like to request that the rule council be the one that calls the roll, if you guys don't mind. Like for here on out, sure. so yeah, I don't have to do this, this anymore. Just for this particular I'm always worried I'm going to forget somebody's yeah. name at the last minute. <laughs> That's why you have the list in front of you. I never go by the list. Uh, Dr. Azalino, do you have any nominations for the office of chair? I'd like to nominate Dr. McLean for chair. Dr. McLean, do you accept the nomination? I would like to decline that nomination. Thank you very much for thinking of me. Um, Dr. Gordon, do you have any nominations for the Office of Chair? No. A little clarification for legal counsel. Just to be clear, because we didn't specify this, because I don't think we anticipated this, but should someone be nominated and the person declined, should we provide the board member with an additional opportunity to either self-nominate or nominate somebody else? Well, that would be discretionary. Um, yes. I think that's a good idea. I'll abstain right now. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lichtman, do you have any, uh, do you have any nomination for the office of chair? Do you accept the nomination? Uh, I do not. I, I would decline at this time. Dr. Lickman, do you have another alternative? I do not. Dr. McLean, do you have a nomination for the office of chair? I would like to nominate Dr. Azarino. Dr. Azalino, do you accept the nomination? We're going to need a chair, right? Eventually, <laughs> somebody um, And it's not binding, correct? That's correct. All right, so I'll, I'll accept. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Mr. Rufino, do you have a nomination for the office of chair? I do not. Dr. Dane, do you have a nomination for the Office of Chair? I do not. Did, does uh, any board member who abstained have a nomination for Office of Chair at this time? Hearing none, uh, Dr. Isolino has been nominated for the Office of Chair and has accepted the nomination. Turn into the office of vice chair. Dr. Azalino, do you have a nomination? Um, Dr. McLean, are you willing to do vice chair? Yes. I will accept. Dr. 
Perez Lino has nominated Dr. McLean and she's accepted the nomination. Dr. Gordon, do you have a nomination for the Office of Vice Chair? I do not. Dr. Lichtman, do you have a nomination for the Office of Vice Chair? Mr. Rakina. I decline. Mr. Lichtman is nominated. Dr. Lichtman is nominated. Mr. Rufino, Mr. Rufino has declined. Dr. Lippin, do you have any further nominations, alternative nominations for the Office of uh, Vice Chair? I do not. Dr. McLean, do you have any nominations for the Office of Vice Chair? I do not. Mr. Rufino, do you have a nomination for the Office of Vice Chair? I do not. Dr. Dan, do you have a nomination for the Office of Vice Chair? Dr. McLean has been nominated for the Office of Vice Chair and she has accepted the nomination. Turning now to the Office of Secretary, Dr. Azzolino, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? Um, I'd like to nominate Mr. Rufino. Mr. Rufino, do you accept the nomination? I accept. <coughs> Dr. Gordon, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? I do not. Dr. Lichtman, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? I know. Dr. McLean, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? I do not. Mr. Rufino, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? I do not. <clears throat> Dr. Dane, do you have a nomination for the Office of Secretary? I do not. Mr. Rufino has been nominated and has accepted the nomination for the Office of Secretary. That concludes the nominations at this time. Madam Chair, I have a quick, another, unfortunately another question just to clarify. I know I asked earlier, but I want to make sure. So the nominations are not closed. Uh, I want to ask counsel, so which means then that between now, if I understand correctly, I want to understand, between now and the January meeting, you could potentially someone else can self-nominate themselves? You could? Well, certain procedures have been proposed, but uh, and I'm not the board's parliamentarian, but under the uh, Roberts Rules of Order, uh, the nominations do not close until the actual election. So uh, the process has been developed, but if uh, the board does use Robert's rules as a guideline, then under Robert's rules, um, nominations can still be accepted at the time of the election due to changes in circumstances or other factors. So council, I need to ask a quick question. Uh, it, would I be out of order <coughs> if I move to close the nominations? If the, and let the board decide whether they want to close the nomination or whether they want to leave this opening. It is just contrary to what I am accustomed to, and I've been doing elections forever. Typically, once the nominations are set in place, you close the nomination. So you, uh, otherwise, I mean, why even go into this process if come January, I want to self-nominate myself or somebody wants to self-nominate. It's just, it's just something it doesn't make sense to me. But, if it is out of order, I will withdraw. Otherwise, I'd like to make that motion that the nomination be closed. But potentially, that is a matter that's within the discretion of the board. However, because it was not agendized in that way, action cannot be taken on that motion at this time. Because there's no action item reflected in the agenda for such a motion. Okay, so one last uh, follow-up. So, but it can be agendized. I can request it to be agendized at the next board meeting. Not necessarily for this election, but for the future. For the future ones, yes? Yeah. It can be placed on the agenda. Uh, the board can act, and um, the effective date of the uh, motion uh, could be part of the motion. It could be um, something, if the board wishes, it could be put in place for the next election, or it could be put in place for this election. It's up to the board's discretion. So will we not have to have 
an agenda item to see if there are any changes to the nominations, if people accept or decline, or prior to taking a vote, obviously. It's going to have to be a two-part procedure next uh, next meeting. If I may, the, the, uh, the problem I see with closing the nominations is that if somebody who's nominated for whatever reason is no longer on the board in a few months, if mm -hmm. they decide to move or whatever, we get a new board member appointed where, you know, that person's precluded from um, being nominated. So, but the, the most problematic would be if you close the nominations and then somebody um, isn't continuing to serve on the board or decides they don't want to serve in that capacity, then then can you go back and unclose the nomination? I, I don't know. You're well, I, I mean, I think our rules uh, allow for that. If somebody um, would we, we, we just take a revote, but my question was actually different, and maybe I should wait on that. But my thought was we're going to have to have a two-part procedure next meeting. If we don't close that, we ask if there are any changes to any of the nominations, or and, and then yes. take take yep. the next step forward with the vote. That would be the best procedure. And also, Mr. You know, just to be clear. Um, this procedure was discussed and voted on at the Board of the Party meeting. Um, they did discuss whether or not the, the nomination should be closed or stay open until the previous meeting, and that was something that the Board decided that they wanted to do at the previous meeting. Well, with all the respect that I'm not trying to... Well, I'm just, I'm just, clarifying. But I'm, I just, I'm just clarifying. For clarification, I did not know that anywhere in the minutes that there was a discussion about closing the nomination or that process. So there may have been, and I'm not saying that it wasn't. I was not there, so I don't know. But I did not know that it anywhere in the minutes that that it was part of the procedure, nor was that discussed. Uh, because otherwise, I would not have raised the question. Okay, so board members, it's tab 13. Um, and for those in the audience um, or watching, uh, there's a memo entitled Executive Officers Report. Um, and so I'll be reporting on the, the items on the, listed on the agenda. So first of all, um, administration. Um, we have two vacancies at the moment that we've been active re actively recruiting for and um, anticipate filling in the very near future. Um, we've conducted interviews for both of these positions. And that's um, an analyst position in the enforcement unit and the manager position in the enforcement unit. Um, so we, um, we hope to have those filled very soon, uh, possibly before the beginning of December. And um, we're in good shape uh, staffing-wise. Um, budget, um, we, there's a fund condition included in your handouts under tab B. Um, this just, um, this is the fund condition as it is. It doesn't reflect the, um, the fee increase. We, we haven't um, received updated documents from the budget office at this time. We will be meeting with them in the near future. Um, to, to discuss our budget overall, and um, we will, as soon as we're able to meet with the department and, um, you know, and get the updated information, we'll provide a substantive review of the budget. And I, um, I intend to have somebody from the department, from the department's budget office, um, attend to answer any questions and walk us through that. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we do have the one with the increase, which shows um, the 
that you know we were projected to remain solvent and have a healthy budget into um, the quite a ways into the future and this goes all the way to 23 24 fiscal year so um, you know just based on these projections we're confident that the fee increase will address um, any budget issues we've had um, into the future but we will be um, you know, as we meet with budgets and as these as we get um, you know through this fiscal year we're, we're constantly updating the projections but I don't anticipate any issues um, so next is um, licensing um, we have the um, it's a handout it's one I think this is a supplemental handout that was in um, those blue folders that you have. And um, we, um, there hasn't been any significant changes in licensing. Um, we, uh, we have, we're a little bit higher than we were in July, um, but lower than we were in August. So it's, you know, there, there's fluctuations throughout the year, but as I've been telling you um, for a while now, um, the, the trend is still down or roughly flat, but um, ever so gradually um, our license population is going down. And um, we have, um, and we'll be discussing that a little later on, we, we have researched um, other states and the schools to see what the, and other professions as well, to see what the trends are um, as far as their license population. And we'll be reporting on that a little later. But for right now, we remain pretty consistent as far as um, license population. Uh, and then enforcement. Just tab C, or no, tab D. Um, so we have our, um, our handout that shows um, up to the most current fiscal year in the far right column is a fiscal year 18-19 and um, which began July 1st, uh, so we're fairly um, early into the year, and we have 66 complaints that we've received so far. And um, you going down, this is the same. Um, I have a question. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. So I see that there's 278 pending, even though we're short into the fiscal year, and I'm assuming that's some carryover from last year. Yeah, that's always because we're always whatever we're dealing with. Because sure. you know, some cases, um, relatively minor cases, may get closed in a month. To um, some cases, may take closer to a year to close. So there's um, there's always cases that are carrying over from prior. Yeah, I just want to reports. point that out on the record. Otherwise, yeah. it looks a little deceiving. Yeah, that's um, so that that can be confusing sometimes to see um, that number going up, but. But it fluctuates depending on the volume coming in and um, the complexity of the cases that we're already working on. Uh, so, uh, but the the average um, we the number of pending and like if you look at 16, 17 was down below 200. But um, but right now we're it's pretty consistent. At any given time, we have you know, between 250 and 300 um, pending cases. And then I don't know if have any of the other um, data down the line, if anybody has any questions about the number of disciplinary actions taken or anything, I'd be happy to answer. I'd like to see, well, beyond that, just when we look at the number, not the number of complaints, but the type of complaints, I'd like to see if there are some trends over the last decade. What we're seeing that is more prevalent now, obviously we have some advertising violations and whatnot, but I think it would be helpful for us to know where we could better direct our efforts. Yeah, there, um, as far as types, I mean, you know, because we do have our top ten, and we know most of um, the complaints we get uh, uh, somehow or another uh, fall under 317, which is unprofessional conduct. That's a very broad um, classification, but we, we do tend to see um, a lot of the similar types of complaints coming in. There are some like micro trends that that we see, um, you know, for instance, um, I, I know when I started working for the board, it was the DRX 9000. There were a lot of complaints related to that, and we've had um, different specific issues where all of a sudden we'll see a lot of similar complaints um, coming in re regarding that same um, either advertisement or procedure, or uh, and but 
they usually would fall into a classification that were already, you know, like advertising or um, or scope of practice or something. So we we do see some specific types or variations within those classifications, if that makes sense? Yes, sure. And as you know, from my entire time here on the board, I keep repeating myself that I'd like to see us, and we've done a great job of being proactive. I think we need to be even, we can be even more proactive. So if we start graphing the trend and we see that this is what we're starting to see, maybe we can make some efforts before that year end and notify the CCA, and notify licensees online because unfortunately there's probably always a and maybe a small maybe a large number I'm not sure of people that are violating the law unknowingly yeah and, and certainly we're going to be protecting the public that, there's there's a number of things that we've been um, working on recently uh, for one we're we're having our investigators while they're out in the field um, uh, do drop-ins, kind of like inspections at chiropractors' offices, and you know we've asked them to go into the database and um, find chiropractors in that area. In particular, chiropractors who've been licensed maybe less than five years, go to their office, bring them information, um, bring them a copy of the law and some other information about the board, and um, offer to answer questions and um, let them know if there's any minor violations that are obvious from looking around their office, such as not having their license posted. Uh, so we, you know, we want to do that as an outreach, just to let them know that we're there as a resource, and also to, um, you know, if they do have any questions or there's something they're not clear on, they they have an opportunity to ask. And as far as the tracking of these um, these trends, we we will focus on that. And one of the things that will help that, and we're in the process of, is updating our IT system. And once um, once we do that, we'll we'll be able to. Um, fine-tune what we track right now we're limited to tracking things by the code section that was violated and doesn't that doesn't give specifics about you know what that was related to if it's advertising or, um, in the down the line and probably be a couple of years before we're fully um, in a new database but we will be able to um, track more under more headings and classifications so that we can um, you hone in on, because as I was mentioning to you earlier, we're starting to get questions and um, a few complaints related to stem cell, something, you know, a year ago that wasn't on our radar. Um, so, you know, right now we don't know, we haven't really focused on it, and we haven't had um, any cases that, you know, have gone far in the process, but we may be, um, that may be a trend. Yeah, but I also think we're going to do the profession and the public a great service if we put out a statement on that and pu publish it on our website. I mean, you could go to each office, and I think that's great to do so, but you're dealing, at, dealing with things on a one-by-one -one basis, whereas yeah. we could, if we roll back the clock to 10 years ago, and rather than letting the entire DRX issue play out with 100 cases, why not, after we see three, four, or five cases, put out a statement to clarify any questions people may have. We place that on our website, and it's going to um, help a lot of practitioners and certainly help the public. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And we, we are doing, and um, we, can, um, we can, I don't know if we're looking at that specific, but we are working on um, frequently asked questions. And so if we're starting to, if um, you know, we're asking the staff that answers the phones, and we're also keeping track of questions that get asked when we do public presentations or questions asked at board meetings, um, so we're, we're tracking those, and we plan on uh, putting those in our newsletters and on the website so um, people can look at the frequently asked questions, and they may have already been asked. Uh, so we'll, um, you will try to post more of that type of stuff uh, on the website. And if, if they're, we have to be kind of careful about putting a statement on the website as far as you can or can't do this. Uh, you know, we, it's, so, but if there's, if there's things that are questions that people ask and, and there is a black and white answer where we can point directly to a law, um, we can provide information about that. But when it comes to interpretation of the law or if we're dealing with a hypothetical, um, it may be problematic. Sure. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. So I'm just going to use the DRX as an example because it's something that's happened in the past. Yeah. Um, before there was a 
completed disciplinary case, would we have been able to put something on the website saying we're getting a lot of complaints or investigations about this type of equipment, please? I mean, we before there's a disciplinary conclusion, would there be would there have been something that we could put on the website? Um, I guess that's what I'm asking. Uh, that's hard to say. It's, you know, because the thing with the DRX, as with um, a lot of other um, well, let's put STEM trends stuff. that we see, like, yeah, is, well, and with that, we don't, we don't really know. And because it's kind of, we're getting some people or calling us, CD, uh, yeah, CD, you know, how yeah. do we know what to put on there? Could we put, we have been getting a lot of complaints, please consult with your attorney, or like for STEM, could we say there have been an increasing number of complaints about this, remember, according to, you know, whatever, yeah, you are not allowed to, punk, you know, according to Chiropractic Act, you cannot puncture the skin, you know, just, so, the, so it's not, it hasn't come to a disciplinary conclusion, but there are things that we can say, like, hey, you should probably take yeah. a look at this. Yeah, because, like, well, with the DRX, um, the issue wasn't so much with the um, device itself, the advertising. but it was the advertising. Right. And that was really problematic. And, um, you know, and with advertising, that's always a very gray area. And um, there's, a, with a lot of the advertising, there's a fine line where they're potentially saying something that's misleading, but it's hard to prove uh, or make that case that um, something is misleading. And if they're technically stating things accurately, but it's kind of sensational. Uh, so it's it's hard to address all of the, but we we probably could. I'd have to defer to Ken on this. On a case by case basis. On a case by case, we probably could um, just do a reminder. Say you know we've um, we've become aware that um, it's something gonna, is. I, I don't. I, I'd have to look at it's it. It's going to take a little way. work to draft that. Yeah. To make sure we're careful, but I think the upside is is tremendous. Yeah. When we deal with stem cells, for instance, there's no harm in reminding everybody that we cannot puncture the right. skin. Right. The and thing I'm um, looking back at is, um, this was a few years ago, but I believe most of the members were on the board at that time. Um, somebody came across a memo that was written by a former board employee that was a, um, a guidance memo or something about the law or what chiropractors can and can't do. And those were deemed to be underground regulations. And we actually, the board actually had to make a statement at a board meeting and post a statement on our website um, saying that this is not, you know, because the board was giving a legal opinion, basically. And we couldn't do that. So we just have to be careful not to go into that territory. Um, Can I ask a, a question? Sure. Kind of piggybacking on that, some of that. So um, with the way that you, uh, you guys um, provide us with the information of the breakdown, because these categories are so broad and general, like, is it possible for you to, so that we can start tracking these things too, possible for you to, like, um, take the top three and list out, like, under gross negligence, what, a, what are you seeing most of, or under moral two, what are we seeing most of, so that we can kind of, like you said, start targeting, okay, well, we're seeing a lot of, so yeah, well, a lot of moral turpitude, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, um, and I'm not using an appropriate legal term probably, but that's kind of an add-on. Um, if somebody, um, that often is, um, is added on when we're dealing with a criminal conviction and we're pursuing discipline, and if they, um, that could be sexual misconduct, that could be insurance fraud, or so, that's, um, that's something that was added on because they're being charged with something specific and then um, w they go out on like moral turpitude or um, right. a general unprofessional conduct or different things that um, are related to the actual. So you want to know what the actual violation. Well, uh, we're going to kind of start looking at, you know, what are the trends of violations. Um, That's a good question. Because it's along with what you're saying. So I just want to be clear, like there's the complaints and there's actually what the, the end part, the adjudication. So we get a lot of complaints where they'll be open for three, four, or five different things, but that's not necessarily what we end up taking action against them in the end. So do you guys want both or Why one not? or the other? Well, the, the I other would suggest both, and I, as I suggested before, I mean, there's only so many things that we're dealing with, so why not just have them listed on an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and just have them checked? 
on each individual case. I don't think it's that much work, and it'll it'll give the board members a clear, concise subcategory of each violation, and that data can be extremely beneficial for us to then direct, educate the CCA, educate our stakeholders on what we're commonly seeing. Because I think the complaints that we see have relevance also, even though they may not, you know, be fully adjudicated. Yeah, the, um, yeah well, well, I'll have to go back and, um, so. and meet, talk about that with staff, because, the, 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 you know, I don't want to point out problem, uh, p potential problems, but the um, most complaints have more than one allegation or more than one violation. And so, so then it may look like there's actually more, compl you know, one, one complaint may have three or four different violations. And, you know, so, but it's just one complaint. And if we start separating those out, we may, um, it may end up looking like we have more complaints than we actually do. Or, uh, well, I'm proposing that when a complaint comes in, we have a master Excel spreadsheet that whoever's processing that just checks, 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 checks each and every, um, yeah. you know, and that is, that is something we're, we've been um, working on is because we do, in addition to the, the consumer affairs system, that's our official tracking system, um, we do have an, um, an Excel spreadsheet that the enforcement analysts and the enforcement investigators use. And we are able to identify more specific information in those. So we, we have been capturing that and we'll be able to um, focus in on some of these like micro trends that I was mentioned, mentioning such as stem cell. So um, six months or a year from now, you know, if that does in fact end up being a trend, we'll, we'll be able to look back and identify um, all the cases that involve stem cell. And, um, and then, you know, to gather any information out of that, we probably, we probably need to look at the individual Complaints I mean, to see what what you know was it all the same violation or were there different things all involving stem cells? There are two separate so, spreadsheets, yeah. but I also think that would be extremely valuable to just have for all of our licensees, all the stakeholders, because if you're thinking about getting into stem cells and you look and suddenly you see this big spike on the board website of complaints on stem cells, then maybe you will not um, be so apt to jump into it. Maybe you'll get legal counsel to really vet and look at these uh, procedures closely. So, uh, you know, I don't want to give you guys much more work, but I think it is of great value. Okay. Um, at the previous board meeting, Dr. Gordon identified that it would be um, helpful for her if she was able to receive um, the meeting packets and just generally um, board materials for review, if she could receive those electronically. And due to some good timing, the department actually has um, procured a system that allows us to send and receive electronic documents to board members in a secure way. And so we've been utilizing that, as you all know, um, for the last about month, six weeks now. And I think it's helpful. Thank you. Um, and so that's great. And so that was perfect timing. Have we had any issues with obtaining and accessing those files? No. I was able to access everything you sent. Okay. No issues with that. Um, but as stated before in prior meetings, um, will this enable us to Speed up the process of getting the information more than seven days or in advance? The in and of itself, no. Like, but we will be able to send, once that information is available, we can send it immediately. In real time, we so can, yeah, we can make it available. And, and didn't we do that this last time? We, we were on a flow basis. So as, as documents were ready, we were making them available to the board members. I mean, yes and no. So the, the petitioners came faster than it would have come otherwise and usually does. Um, we sent the actual information for the board meeting about two days prior to it being sent out. And so... So what else can we do to, to improve in that? So okay. if you want, if you literally want an individual notification for each item of the finisher, we can do that. 
So I just wanted to be clear. So if you if we finish in a memo and a, an a agenda item, you got to like that sent individually. I think the key to that um, is making sure it's either in a Dropbox format or something so that it's all consolidated. Yeah. I mean, and electronically, but that, yes. that would be the, was the will of the board. So that we don't miss an email or so. And it right. seems like that, yeah, that system that's, that's... That would be my only concern about missing one of the documents. But ultimately, I think um, if even if we do that at the end, like I think you did here, uh, when you updated something, you sent the compilation of everything yeah. uh, at the end, that would be great. But the, certainly, we talked about before, at least getting the bulk of things as soon as possible, the sooner the better with our schedules and lives are. We'll, we'll meet internally and, um, and figure that out and, yeah, and, um, and send out an email letting you Particularly know. Particularly when we have the magnitude of documents that we had like similarly today. And then also we're we currently, so we're in the process of preparing a new IT system as Mr. Pulio referred to earlier in the day. We're currently on the second of a four-stage procurement process, and so we've completed the first part. We've had to sign off and, and approval from the DTA office agency, and it's currently under review at the Department of Technology. And we've commenced the second part, which is um, gathering information related to other systems, and we make some considerations. We're determining the requirements that we need in a new system. So it's a pretty lengthy process, but we're almost halfway through it. So, what other boards are using this system? We don't. See, we're in the process of deciding like the functionality that we need, and once we make the determination on what we need, then we go out and see. We'll go out to bid, and, and what happens is they send out the requirements to a bunch of different vendors, and the vendors that meet the needs that we identify, they'll send us back a bid, and we make a consideration amongst those options at that point. So we're not quite to that stage yet, but that's what will happen in the future. Backing up a little bit, um, as most of you probably remember, um, we the department was um, uh, procuring or procured a new database that um, called Breeze that all of the boards and bureaus were going to be rolled into, and they had three phases. Um, we were in release three, um, releases one and two. Um, the boards that were in those um, were rolled into the new IT system. Um, release three, there were there were issues with the contract and so on. Um, so the release three boards, there's nine of us, I believe, um, didn't get in there. So we, we're still using the old CAS system. So we, be, because of what happened with Breeze, the Department of Information Technology has implemented a new um, project approval um, process, and which is long and detailed, and we, we're in the midst of that. So we don't know. We we might end up in Breeze. We might that might end up being um, what we end up um, having ultimately. But we might end up in another system that provides the same or even better, uh, the same or even better capability. So we don't know what we're going to have yet. But I'm confident that we're going to wind up with the best system for us. And we we are we've um, Department of Consumer Affairs, the, um, the solid um, their training division has worked with us in the process mapping, which is the first part of uh, this. So we mapped all of our processes to identify those processes that um, can be automated and how we can streamline those. We've also, um, uh, we've been looking at interim steps we can do. We anticipate in um, the spring of 2019 being, having the capability of online renewal and credit card payments, which we're very excited 2019? about. 2019, this coming spring, um, I, I can't guarantee, but <laughs> so um, so we're already um, we're already working on that and hope to get that in place. And and the way we're kind of the timing's good because we will be able to um, phase these things in, and then when we ultimately get a new system, the transition should be seamless. Um, so so we would have to make changes internally. But the licensee who, uh, who's using our system for online renewal and so on, um, there shouldn't be any change. Everything will look the same and respond the same as it is, um, as it is or was. Um, 
so so that's that'll be um, an easier learning curve for licensees because they won't have to adjust to a whole new system. We can phase in things uh, um, like the online renewal. We're also working um, on procuring a vendor to help us do an automated um, CE tracking system where we would be able to um, have licensees and providers all um, using this account and um, putting information in. So uh, it's, which would, the cool thing about that is it would give us 100% um, auditing once we get that in place if everything works out. So um, the, the CE providers would be able to um, populate and once, they, once they've offered a course. Um, they can let us know who, um, who passed that course, who got a certificate, and um, we can attribute that to the appropriate licensees. And it will all be there, and the, the licensee will have an online account. And they'll be able to see the progress of their CE, and if they still have anything remaining to take when they get closer to uh, their uh, expiration. So, so that's, that's another one that we're working on. And we're little by little, and hopefully within two years, we'll be fully functional in our new IT system. So yeah, and I'll have, once we get to, uh, once we get closer, um, or maybe even a little later, or sometime in 2019, um, I'll have somebody from OIS who can um, better explain you know, what we're doing and um, what our capabilities will be. I can have somebody come in provide that information to the board. So, um, uh, Is that I think that was it. We, um, okay, and then, oh, so this, why is, why is there a handout and one in the book? Um, one of the paper technicals included initially. Oh, okay. So board members for the next item, which is where we there? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, fourteen. So fourteen is not the supplemental is for item fifteen. Oh, what am I? What is fourteen? Fourteen is licensing trends. Oh, that's oh. So um, staff has um, done quite a bit of research contacting, um, contacting other boards in California, other um, professions, um, as well as boards um, from across the country and you know, their, uh, their licensing trends going back to 2007 and the you know, number of licensees and other populations um, have gone up or down. And um, as you can see there, if you look at the far right column, um, it, it shows you whether they're up or down. And it's, it's about 50-50 for chiropractic boards across the country. And, you know, there's a significant number um, where their number of licensees is down. But I'd like to note also, if we look at the bottom, and thank you, staff, for doing this. It's very helpful. Unfortunately, when we look at other California Healing Arts Boards, the only one that is going down is chiropractic. And I'm glad people from the school and the association are here because we have to take note, people. We can't be the only one that's going down and talk about how wonderful we are because other people don't uh, get it. I'm not a dentist, but I am a chiropractor, so I'd like to focus on uh, what we could do. Um. So just to be clear, as far as the other healing arts boards, um, actually, and I have some questions too. I just, while well, we're... Go ahead, Dr. McLean. Um, just, um, thank you, this is very helpful. Um, but looking at what 
what's going on um, uh, and the um, research that you did in understanding the internal and external factors that impact it. What were some of those internal and external factors besides, of, co of, of course, I know that previously we've spoken with Dr. Egan and others at SEU that said cost of school and competition of other careers um, secondary to um, uh, average income earn, earn, earning potential. What are some of the other internal and external factors that you guys um, were able to research? I mean, central for, I mean, with this particular project, we were just looking at the trends. Yeah. We didn't look at contributing factors. I think for us, it's a little bit outside of our purview to make that determination as to those factors because we're only one small part of it. Um, but I think, again, it's an ongoing conversation. And you did participate in our, I think, last year in the meeting that we had with chiropractic stakeholders across the country. So beyond that, we haven't done any outside additional research beyond just us pontificating in the office about what's going on and what we think is going on. So would that be an appropriate next step to communicate with mm -hmm. the schools and, and the other organizations so that we can find out, you know, just get an idea of those trends, what those factors might be besides what I think that's the million dollar question. I think that's what everybody's trying to figure out. Why are we going down? Yeah. And I don't, I, I mean, I think that if you talk to licensees, they're going to say it's because of reimbursement factors and and income, and if you ask students, they're going to say it's because our loans are too high and we can't repay them back. If you talk to associations, they're going to say apathy. But I will, since since Dawn is here from Cal Cairo, I will say that um, Florida had probably the biggest. I figured out some percentages of the increases and decreases in the states for their licenses, and um, Florida had had the biggest increase overall. And they are well known to have a very strong state association. So, um, and I'm not saying that there's not other factors. They have, they have different licensing factors in Florida than they have here too. So that may be part of it as well that makes their state association stronger. But I, I just, I think that's the million dollar, that's what everybody would like to know the answer to and we just can't seem to figure it out. Yeah, well, and I, I think. I think in that discussion, were, Marcus, weren't they talking about um, that they we're all looking at that, and is there some feedback that we can get? Because that's been quite a while. Since I'd like to weigh in on that real quick before you answer that. Um, from a research perspective, we have to be extremely careful with who we listen to in that regard, because unless it's a, an appropriately blinded um, questionnaire or survey, uh, you're going to get a lot of a lot of bias coming from the institutions individually and from the associations and whatnot because we all have it. It's a selection bias, and you know and we're going to all in um, weigh in with our opinions. So, yes, it's great to have that conversation. I think we should be having that conversation openly, and I think we should. It should be at the top of the list for all the schools, the institutions, the, um, the associations, and the board to have that ongoing conversation. But on the same token, you know, once again, we just have to be cautious with uh, taking that as a definitive word. Um, if I remember correctly, I think in the last year, there was an extensive study done by Palmer do you know what I'm talking about, Dr. I, I do. They did, a, they did a Gallup poll. Oh. But oh, it wasn't a study. It okay. was a Gallup poll That's about okay. patient satisfaction, um, all, all kinds of things. But I don't think it was okay. technically a study. Yeah, yeah, see, and beyond that, uh, that's part of the problem. I don't think there's anybody looking at this like at the national level. I don't think there's any serious research being done on the chiropractic profession throughout the United States. I, 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 uh, I would say that the ACA is doing so, and I would ask Don if you could please uh, answer this. Are you, as an organization, as the CCA, working in concert with the ACA closely to monitor this? No, we don't have a close relationship with them. We're not affiliated. Um, we have one member who's the So, no, I mean, this is very helpful. And it's just a first step. Yeah, it's, it's, a first step. it's just a snapshot and of what's going on. And we know so. now. And then just to be clear, as far as the integrity of the data, because I want to be clear up front, 
Um, one of the biggest challenges with gathering this data across the states is that there isn't any one body that's collecting this information. Um, we reached out to FCLB. Um, they didn't have this data. So, th so we they have data on their website, um, and so they that they, it's self-reported from the programs. However, that data is not validated. It's not great. Like even it's a, the data well, it's not good. Not everybody participates. And, in, and, and the data that they provide, voluntary. Um, there's not any consistency or standards as far as reporting the data. Even the data that we provide them isn't. Like, it's just for whatever that month is, whatever, say, because, like, for the licensing trends, we take the total. So if we take the total in November, it's not the same as December. And yep. so, so this is a, just a snapshot. I want to be clear that this isn't 100% correct. We did go to the, to the websites of these other state boards, and it's very, 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 very difficult to, a lot of boards don't report the data. A lot of them definitely don't have it on the website. Many, pro, many states told us that if we want this information, we have to submit a public public information request and so I just want to let you guys know that um, sure that it's 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 a challenge but that um, I think there's an opportunity there if the board like it's just I don't well, know, I just, but I wanted to let you know that it's a challenge to get the well even board within board. DCA every board does yeah. things differently and so for, for the department trying to get um, like enforcement or licensing information and look at trends throughout the department um, every board tracks things differently and reports things differently, and so it's um, not always useful information when you put it all in one place. Well, thank you once again, and, and we can lead. Yeah. In this okay. regard, once again, I think this data should be provided to DCA, and DCA should do a better job of monitoring it. Um, and I think it should be provided to the state association, should be provided to the ACA, the schools, and it should be provided to FCLB because there's no reason why FCLB should not be doing this. Yeah. So again, so they do it; it's just self-reporting. Well, they ask for it, but but if people don't report, they they have no. Sure, but if we can identify a trend here that it's you know it seems clear, and it's certainly what many people have felt uh, they've had their finger on the pulse of enrollment going down <laughs> and. and and whatnot in the schools and licensing going down, I think it's worth sharing with the rest of the organizations out there. And if everybody puts their heads together, we may be able to figure out the problem. Any other questions on the licensing trends? So the enforcement trends are um, more of the same, but even more difficult. Um, there definitely are no standards. I don't know that we can draw any conclusions um, with, this, with this data, whether it's across the states or even within DCA. But we did collect the data. So just take this with a grain of salt. That's, this is what the information is. But there is no consistent reporting on any of these things. There's no consistent reporting as far as the terms, what's included in the term. And so we collected the data, we did our best, but this is not helpful at all, in my opinion. So it's there, but I wouldn't draw any hard and fast conclusions from it. Yeah. And may disagree with that. No, no, I agree, because even, even just if we focus on our own board, sometimes there's just unexplained fluctuations in enforcement. We, one year, as um, I was saying earlier, um, I, I, a few years back, um, we had fewer complaints. I think it was like 100 fewer complaints than we um, do on most years. And there's no real explanation from that. Um, from month to month, the number of complaints coming in fluctuates. Um, so, so going from board to board and comparing, it's, um, it's hard to know whether it means anything if their numbers go up or down. And there's certain things, um, terms, as Marcus was saying, that, you know, the terms are mean different things. Like an investigation for one board is different than an investigation for another board. So we have, we have intake and we have the, you know, like the case management and then we have a separate investigation. Some, um, some boards might consider that intake and that review of documents as an investigation. So it's, um, and then it's going to be reported as such. So that makes it difficult to compare. Thank you. Public comments? We'll move on to 
Item number 16, update discussion of possible action on enforcement committee meeting agenda. Dr. Oslino. So since our last meeting, we met on October 10th. Uh, staff provided us with a one-page proposed document um, enumerating the subject matter expert application requirements. You could find that under the second, um, well, it's under tab 16, but hopefully everybody had a chance to read that. It's the second issue there. Um, just nice, clear, concise. And we plan on utilizing this to appeal to various licensees out there, including all licensees and specialty boards and whatnot, so that we can attract as many subject matter experts as possible to the program. Uh, beyond that, we also made some modifications to the application for the subject matter experts. I think those are still highlighted. You guys could see some of those changes. They were not very substantive. It was a lot of wordsmithing. Uh, we cut quite a few things out and really um, clarified some others. I, I have just one question for clarification. Yes. Just terms, the term subject matter expert, we use it for different things. Yes. So when we're asking for subject matter experts to participate in the... Expert business program. Well, no, I know well, that, that I know that's what this uh, yeah, is that's reviewing, but, for but we're asking analysis. for things for the law, the law exam development. Yeah. We're asking for occupational analysis. Those are not the same requirements as an expert reviewer. So I am concerned mm -hmm. with lump, with calling it subject matter expert when we put a call out. You know, so when you say, "Hey, we need subject matter experts for whatever." Um, I know that's not what this is referring to. You're referring to expert reviewers. So should we clarify the two different things? Can we? I don't have yeah. to do that. Well, we could probably. But um, usually when we do a call out, we specify what we're looking for the subject matter experts for. Uh, like we'll say, um, the board is seeking subject matter experts to serve as uh, or to review enforcement and um, you know write you know write a report, um, whatever. We, or we may say that you know we're we're looking for experts to um, to participate in the exam development workshops, and so we'll so they'll know what it is we're looking for experts for. Yeah, but should this application say an application for an enforcement subject matter expert? I think it's probably appropriate that we clarify. Yeah, 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 I think I so. Think that's a great idea um, because I even had questions <laughs> regarding that, yeah. um, and I spent a long time on the phone with Robert trying to figure it all out as well with the various things. So I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, we can clarify both documents. Expert. Can we move forward with this, um, even if we're going to make that change? Make a motion yeah. and just making that substantive change on, on the title? Yes, it would be application for subject matter expert I would for say, enforcement cases. Oh, I would say application for an enforcement so sub subject yeah. matter expert. Yeah. Enforcement subject matter expert. I, 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 I would think it would be most clear to say application for expert witness program. Because specifically, we just want experts okay. to participate in this. Perfect. No, well, I think I think we should say um, application for enforcement program um, subject matter subject expert. matter experts, or um, or we could just say expert. I, I you know because um, what what was your term? Um, expert witnesses. Oh, expert. Uh, so for enforcement program, expert witnesses or. Um, well, I an don't expert like the term witness, witness though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so enforcement so, program expert. I think Enforcement program subject matter expert. Because uh, the, another uh, one of the reasons this concerned me is because oftentimes we do have problems finding subject matter experts, not just for this, but for simpler things. And I think it's because people are intimidated. And if they, if there's any confusion between these requirements and really sometimes for subject matter experts for simpler things, we're just wanting someone who's been licensed for a certain amount of yeah. time. Um, and I think it's a really intimidating process for people. It shouldn't be, but they're intimidated saying, oh, I'm not an expert on this. Well, you're an expert because you're a licensee. Yeah. So if we 
call it something completely different than a subject matter expert, or we call those things different than subject yeah. matter expert, I just think they should be called completely different things because I think it intimidates people. It would be easier for us to change this because right. the, um, the other subject matter experts that we use for exam and occupational analysis, um, we recruit them, but they're actually working with the department's Office of Examination Resources, which um, they refer to them as SMEs, the subject matter experts. Okay. They, and so that, and they do that for all the boards. So, so we'd be better off leaving that alone and then clarifying the name of this. Um, okay, so I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a motion. Thank you for bringing that up. We change this and the subsequent document to just. Well, first of all, we'll stick with this one. Uh, application for enforcement program expert. The other thing that I think, um, oh, sorry. And we can call for discussion. <laughs> Go ahead. <Okay>. I just, <laughs> okay. stream of consciousness. Dixie, um, do, there is no application for the other experts, is there? For the, no. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the other thing. We, we only do the application for the enforcement experts. Yeah, but this. So, oh, I, I know. I have a lot of to clarify it, legal just, case yeah, work so. and whatnot, so. Can we call it a board expert? Oh, he didn't like the word witness, board expert witness. Yeah. Even though that's what we call them informally, yeah. I, I, I think witness implies that you saw something or, you know, that you. No, but no, it implies you're going to testify in court. You, you use that term on the next. On a, yeah. On no, we'll and most brothers do have been, you know, witnesses or cumies or, or whatever, you know that that's so then, be yeah, so we could leave an expectation to be a witness, but it's not necessary. Um, do you like my enforcement program, actually? Uh, I think that's a good well, representation well, of what it is. So that's not a good one. All right. We could use, wit I, they want to use witness. Um, so uh, I, I propose we have one conversation. Is that maybe better? Yeah, have some, uh, <laughs> some discussion. Yeah. So we have a motion on the floor. And if you have some better language, why don't you propose it? And I'm happy to withdraw the motion. I personally like expert witness because I know it has a connotation of you saw somebody steal the candy bar, but as uh, doctors, we all know what an expert witness yes, program is. In our profession, we know exactly in our profession. Yeah. So, the on the floor. Like so while, while, while we have the discussion open, why don't we weigh in on opinions? Do you have other, any other language you'd like to propose? So what specifically do you, application for? My, my motion was application for enforcement program expert, um, but that's what the motion is, and I'm fine shifting that to application for an expert witness um, ex or okay. expert the witness. Subject, the subject matter expert program on the, in the next uh, section on testimony and administrative hearings says as a board expert witness, so just that's where I got that term from. Was, or an expert witness. Right, so that. Any other opinions? I don't know, but everywhere else, it's, it's everywhere else. Hold on, hold on. So. Yeah, one at a time. One at a time here. Ken, do you have any uh, opinions on language? I think that subject matter expert or SME is a term of art with Department of Consumer Affairs. So I echo what Mr. Pulio said about that to avoid that sort of confusion. I think you could call. It a uh, person an expert witness, and it would be understood by um, members of the profession what yes. that means. So, uh, uh, listening as a witness, uh, I don't think would be problematic. You okay, with that now. Yeah, I would recommend um, application for enforcement program expert witness or enforcement expert witness. What do you think? That's fine. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, any other opinions before I withdraw the motion? Dr. Lickman, you had one? Just want to make sure the term is all good. Yep, yeah, they're all good. Just modify your... Dr. Um, McClain? I have no additions. Mr. Rufino? I'm good. Okay, so I'm going to withdraw the motion or modify it to state application for expert witness... No. Enforcement no. expert witness. Enforcement expert witness. Thank you. Okay. I'll second that. Any other discussion? I have some questions. I, I don't know that it's a discussion. I have just some general questions. Should I do it now? Or? 
after we vote? Well, you call it. Will it lead to a potential modification of this application? I don't know. Okay, then we'll any motion is to, uh, to approve the application as amended and it would be appropriate. Um, if there's discussion about any other issues relating to that, otherwise it wouldn't be germane to the motion. So it's not going to result in changes to this application? It's not. It's, it's general okay. um, questions. It's not necessarily about the application. Well, one is about the application. Well, then change the substance of the application. Okay, well, let me just do it. Yeah, let's <laughs> do it. Because I don't want to have to vote again. Yeah. Um, since, since you're coming up with this new application, um, how will this or will it at all affect those who are you're curr currently utilizing as subject matter experts? Because I'm assuming that they didn't have as extensive... I would like to have them all reapply. Okay, that was one question. Very good. Um, and when will you begin accepting applications for new expert witnesses? The minute you vote on this. And how long? <laughs> and once they apply, how long is the vetting process? So we have uh, the board has approved an extensive um, overhaul of this program, and so that's that's the purpose of this revised application. The inclusion of the one pager, that's the recruiting document, and also the explainer of the process. And so at this point, what we don't have. We don't know because we haven't undergone this process, so we don't know how long it will take. But we anticipate, I would hope, that in the spring to be able to do some recruitment. Um, what the board has decided on and approved is uh, the committee. Is a, oh, no, the board, the board approved. Oh, okay. And this is, these are just changes to the application. Mm -hmm. So the, the board has already approved the process. And so what the process will consist of is um, a review, a committee review of a statement of qualifications and an expert report that's provided by each person that wants to be considered to participate in this program. Once the committee has reviewed both of those documents, they'll make a determination on that point who they want to consider for an interview. And those that are interviewed and if they're accepted by the committee, they will be accepted into this program. And so that's how that will go. Okay. But the logistics and specifics of all that process, we haven't determined that because we're still at this stage in the process. So, um, you, Dr. Azzolino said that you would begin utilizing this immediately, but you're not going to start to recruit until the spring? I think, so, before we start the actual recruitment, we identified an enforcement case, and we, we've identified a list of expert witnesses that we want, along with Dr. Azzolino, to provide us with a baseline standard as far as an expert report. And so once we have that back, I think at that point then we can be begin the recruitment. And so we'll give all the people that we provide with the report to review, we'll give them 30 days to write the report, they'll send it back to us and then we'll look at it in consultation with the committee and pull out the things that we think are good and bad and we'll be able to um, create a document or a group of documents that will allow us to be able to um, on the intake of these applications to be able to make an assessment at a very high level on disqualifying criteria. And so every, like if there's something glaringly obvious that's missed or something that's really bad, then we can set those aside, but be able to collect all the rest of the applications and provide it to the committee for review, so. Last question. Um, what some of the, uh, one of the areas of qualifications are the number of hours of practice. Um, does that, uh, does that include or, or are they allowed to, how am I ask that? What about um, doctors who practice via consultations or telehealth or, you know, doing we don't, make a we don't make a distinction, I would, unless I'm told otherwise, I would assume that's back to practice. So the way we've defined it on, if you look at the one pager, the last document, we, we, the criteria is you have to have an active practice defined as 80 hours a month in direct patient, direct patient care, clinical activity, or teaching, and at least 40 hours of those have to be in direct patient care. So yeah. that's, a, it's, that's as much, that's how we define it. Well, let me let me state that. Marcus is correct, but I also think uh, we didn't contemplate that well. 
A and I'm not opposed to adding that in there. So that, that was my question because the function of medicine and, 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 and consultations via you know, teleconference and that sort of thing that, that's on the rise, um, if that had been considered, that's my I would say I don't think that, that the language prohibits that. And I would just, I'm going to defer to you with, but that's active practice. It's active practice, but I also think there's some benefit. I mean, we, we hopefully will capture some of that with their board certifications where their expertise are. Um, I'm not opposed to putting a question in there in that regard, and certainly we could expand that a little further with a questionnaire of, uh, as you know, if you fill out your, when you fill out your malpractice application, it has check marks of what you're doing. Are you using laser, are you using functional medicine, whatever you may be using in your practice? And, and I think there's some benefit to incorporating something of that nature, but I say if we move this forward right now, we can get the process going. We can see how the first round goes, and we can always modify that to next committee okay. meeting. Well, let me ask a question. Um, and you, would that be a disqualifying criteria one way or the other, whether or not you do it or how much you do it? Mm, well, well, I... Because direct patient, when, I, when you say direct, direct patient care, that's what I'm trying to determine. Does that include telehealth as direct patient care? I don't know what your thoughts were. So we didn't consider it, but I mean, we're discussing it now. Do you consider that direct patient care or no? I, I think it could be, certainly. I think it could be. I would prefer it. Personally, I would prefer direct patient care to be face-to-face -face care with hands-on, uh, not functional medicine stuff. I would say uh, direct patient care as for chiropractic itself. I think it's nice to have somebody with those expertise in nutrition and functional medicine and whatnot, but I want to make sure our, our experts are actually um, practicing chiropractic in the truest sense with hands-on. So 40 hours could be in telehealth. Forty hours needs to be direct patient contact. Okay. And you know, I welcome the board's opinion on this. I, 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 I think including telehealth, at, because like I said, as we see the, you know, that direction or that that portion expanding, um, in within chiropractic, I think it's that we should consider including it. So also, would it be in some capacity? Could it be forty hour yeah. direct patient in which? is in direct patient care, comma, not to include telehealth or functional medicine? Well, I, I mean, functional maybe. medicine can be in person, too, so. Yeah, it can. Direct be. patient care, maybe if you want to define, define direct it. patient care, meaning face-to-face, right. -face, one -on -one, one -on -one, one-on-one, one-on-one patient care, face-to-face -face patient care, something like that. Or just non-telehealth. But telehealth could be considered in the other 40 hours. I, I, I'm not sure if you want telehealth included in direct patient care or if you want telehealth it just included in the general 80 hours a month. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm indifferent one way or the other. Okay. other. I just wanted okay. to know that it was not a disqualifier. Well, I mean, I would also put the caveat is we're probably not, I mean, it's not that big of a trend. I know it may seem that way, but how many pract practitioners are really doing a lot of telehealth? I don't want somebody that does 80 hours a month of telehealth to be uh, Nor do I. Yeah, that's what that Nor do I. that's. And as long as it has, is, has come up, we might as well define it. Uh, we could put hands on. Yeah. You know, if it, that's not a technical term, but direct face-to-face -face, um, patient care, non-telehealth. Face-to-face in person, put it that way. Sure. sure. I have a question. and. If, since we're doing interviews, um, do we need to be that specific on the application? Is that, do you want to, are you potentially going to be disqualifying people at, if they're not at doing the application phase? or Because you could get into specifics of what they actually do in their practice and what percentage of time in the interview, like if somebody looks like sure. qualified. I would, personally, I would disqualify somebody if they were not doing face-to-face in-person mm -hmm. care. I think there's a human element there and a, a reality that uh, we need practitioners to grasp. If they're just paper reviewers, I think they may miss some of the human element because most of the complaints that we're dealing with are dealing with face-to-face. -face. Can I say something on that? Uh, section 2 of the application says, are you actively treating patients? Yes, no, yes. How many hours per month? Now, isn't that assuming that is face-to-face -face direct patient care? Well, it's, it's, it's assuming. It's assuming, no, I mean, but we... Wow. For you and I, it would be, but maybe right. not for somebody, somebody else. else. Let's just clarify that. Make sure, yeah. I think, 
fine, you know, however you want to define it. Um, if you, you know. Well, we have a motion on the floor right now, so should we vote on that, and then I can make a second, or you can make a second motion to that, or should we um, just amend the motion, Ken? It would be better to amend the motion. All right. So I'm going to the most efficient way to amend the language that the motion seeks to adopt is in the subject matter expert program guidance. And in that second clause of the parenthetical, we should put at least 40 hours of which is in face-to-face direct patient. Well, the face-to-face, unfortunately, Skype is face-to-face. -face. So face-to-face -to -face in person. Face-to-face -to -face in person. Patient care. Face to face. How about up close and personal? Oh, Robert, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Would that be sufficient? What? Face to face, in person, patient care? Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Okay. So is the motion amended to uh, include that language? It is. And you can even call the roll call this time. <laughs> <laughs> Any more discussion? Did the second or concur in the amendment? Second. Uh, yes, second. by Dr. Dane. Okay. And then what about public comment? Yeah, you're called. Okay. Right. Okay. yes. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Gordon is absent. Okay. Uh, we, well, uh, we can go forward. You good? Okay. So, item number 17 on the agenda, update discussion of possible action on licensing and continuing education committee meeting agenda. Dr. McClain. All right. So, the continuing ed committee is continuing to diligently work on these regs. Um, per the last board meeting, we, can, we discussed the possible definitions of public health and we enlisted um, help with that information or, or content for that information. Uh, additionally, um, from the college, chiropractic colleges, additionally, we continue uh, to look at it and review proposed CPR regulations and suggestions there. Um, we also, um, uh, regarding public health, it was uh, one of the current um, areas, uh, qualified subject matter areas, which replace the common disease from the old regs, and so we wanted to um, sure up that language there. Um, and I believe that the language that we discussed in committee was finally agreed upon. Um, so as we bring those regs before the board, we will bring that back as a part of um, what needs to be reviewed by the full board, ultimately. Um, uh, we also looked at a list of chiropractic adjusted techniques that was provided by the chiropractic colleges. Um, and as we discussed more of that, we decided to expand that list to include uh, specialty boards and um, uh, a list of approved um, an approved list from uh, the chiropractic colleges throughout the United States because we originally only looked at the, the um, colleges here in California. Um, so we're waiting right now on this information, the new information from the national uh, list of chiropractic techniques and we'll review that at our next committee meeting. Additionally, um, like I said, we looked at proposed CPR regulations language and staff is still however working on the new revisions that was discussed um, including what else? Well staff is still working on, on the language there of what we determined was important at that time. So um, the committee also began to look at um, additional areas in the regulation, which included the alternative pathways, um, provider qualifications, the definition of a course, because it's so general and broad, we're trying to define it to enable staff to um, be able to better uh, determine what is a, will be approved 
um, we look at the denial and appeals process and um, license reporting requirements. Um, and so we will continue to review the proposed um, language that we've been accumulating in addition to what was discussed here today regarding separating the application for continuing ed providers to come up with the appropriate language for regulations so that we can begin to pass some of these through. Our challenge, we, uh, we, we were challenged in that as we discussed more and more the nuances of these regulations, more things began to come up just like you saw here today. One question can kind of uh, sidetrack you or, or railroad you a little bit and we um, wanted to make sure that we were being as thorough as possible so when we when these sidebars come up we basically have have taken our time with trying to get all of the language properly vetted so any additional information that you guys would like to add one moment did you have any additional thing to add dr dr Hinn? no i just uh, no just based on um some feedback i gave earlier in the board meeting um, I would like to make sure it makes it in our discussion about us, because we all seem in agreement about the board having the ability to maybe uh, dictate mandatory hours when we had that, we talked about that earlier with the concussion regulations from Oregon. Oh, so I add that in. For the yeah, I just want to make sure as the chair, if, if you're comfortable, we could add that into our discussion. I don't, I don't want it to get forgotten in this when we're talking about changing the rights. So, just for clarification, for us to add in the ability to be, I don't know, more flexible there? To be able to dictate mandatory hours and change them severely, basically. Maybe a health crisis that comes forward uh, mm -hmm. we need to yep. address. Yeah, it should be discretionary on the board's part. We should certainly have to go through the regulatory process that we're dealing with right now to have such slow. Right. And but that's my question, because I don't know how likely that is. If we have, so what they're asking is if we, can we write the regulations such that we have the flexibility to make changes to requirements to licensees without having to, like by circumventing the regulatory process? So could we put, say, four hours to be determined by the board at I, its leisure type of thing? Well, I don't even want to say that. That's, sorry, Ken. <laughs> Go ahead. The purpose of the regulations themselves is to make specific and to apply the law. And so the regulations have to be certain enough to provide some sort of a standard that could be enforceable uh, and could apply um, to the um, was being regulated. So um, you can't have a regulation, for instance, that says it would be up to um, board discretion to determine what um, uh, is necessary to complete in terms of CE units, anything like that. How about if we define it as current topics in health and disease or something of the sort? My suggestion is we discuss this at the committee, okay. and Mike Potton, I will possibly, and I, I get California is its own animal, but I would like to talk to the people in Oregon yeah. and find out what kind of obstacles, if yeah, any, sure. they had to overcome and how they did that. For sure. And at least we'll be able to give a, a, a reasonable answer back to the board members if that's, that we've explored all options. And uh, I'd like to also say for the record that at the committee meeting on September 25th, there were public members, stakeholders uh, participating. Mm -hmm. um, it added quite a bit to the discussion mm -hmm. um, that's being presented today, including uh, Dr. Lupkin and, and Don Benton. Uh, and so it was very helpful to have uh, members uh, of uh, the public and stakeholders uh, there at the uh, committee meeting to engage, help engage in the process before the regulations are being right. um, uh, written. Uh, Natalie, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Were there other participants at that meeting? Do you have? Do you recall? Um, oh. Roy Eisenberg was present. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. That's um, Dr. Egan was present with Dr. McLean and Dr. Benda. 
Eric Bannon? Bannon. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Eric Bannon. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so just wanted to... Um, I'd like to state for the record that Dr. Lubkin disseminated an email that's grossly inaccurate about what transpired at that meeting. Oh, and that was right. disseminated among um, some stakeholders, so... Um, just to add that research that you mentioned, Dr. McLean, of um, reaching out to the schools and reaching out to the specialty boards has been progressing. Um, I've only haven't heard back from four chiropractic colleges, and I'm still waiting to hear back on four specialty boards. But at the next CE committee meeting, we'll see um, all the information. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's all I have. Okay. Any uh, discussion? or public, other public comment about agenda item number 17. We are scheduled for a 15 minute break. Uh, return to agenda item number seven, approval of June 5th, 2018 board meeting minutes. Um, so can someone make a motion to approve the minutes? So we can have discussion. It's, it's tab number seven. I move to approve the June 5th, 2018 board minutes. Is there a second? I will second it. Okay. Can we have discussion? Or is there some new information, Robert, and well, Dr. McLean? Well, there was a, um, a question earlier when, when this item came up earlier um, about requested amendments that Dr. McLean had made um, that weren't, weren't um, corrected in the June 5th minutes. But then afterwards, in discussing it with the, the staff, um, it, we determined that the reason that it wasn't changed in the June 5th minutes is because the June 5th minutes reflected what you, Dr. Dane, actually said. Um, Dr. McLean had asked you to share her comments, and you um, you made a statement. It was um, it was reflected in the minutes, and then at the subsequent um, meeting, she clarified that that's not what uh, she intended to say. And that's reflected in those minutes. In the August 9th minutes. Uh, yeah, in August 9th minutes. But but technically, the June 5th minutes are correct. So are there, they reflect what was actually said at that meeting. So are there going to be amendments to the June 5th in any way? Uh, can we put something in there that says Dr. McClain was not present? Or please reference the August 9th. That's my question, Mr. Okay. Swanson. I mean, is it hearsay, and should it just be noted in parentheses that she was not here to comment? Uh, that would be the best approach. The minutes themselves, while a record of a public proceeding, uh, do not have to have um, every detail of discussions. So as long as it fairly reflects what happened, and in particular, any action taken by the board, so uh, it would be fair to insert a parenthetical if this was an area of concern. And so um, it can be done, uh, by, if, if necessary, by um, if there's a pending motion to amend the motion to reflect that. Um, and I think I may have been uh, outside the room when earlier yeah. that came up. Uh, that, that's what my recommendation would be, Dr. McLean. Would, would you like a reference to the August the August 9th minutes where you yes. clarified. Well, I would say wherever your name is listed, it would be easier just wherever your name is listed that it's in parentheses that um, Dr. McLean was not present. But she was at part of the meeting. I was at part of it, but okay. wherever I was. Well, whatever, it, wherever yeah, you yeah. want that. Wherever well, I was not present, then so the staff would additionally, like Dr. Jane said, yeah, but to yeah. um, reflect that there is clarification in the or corrections or clarification in the next minute, then that would be satisfactory to me. It would be satisfactory for you yes. to indicate the correct the correction in the August 9th yes. 
minutes by the June 5th minutes, in that section of the June 5th minutes. Yes. We see August 9th, we can put, you know, page whatever. I mean, I think that makes it a lot more complicated. I think it would be easier just to put in the statements that you may not be comfortable with. Uh, you could just put in parentheses that you were not here and it, you know. It doesn't say it, it says it at the beginning. It says it at the beginning, but if there are statements that, because, well, the, they're on page two under discussion, if you go down the third from the bottom, it says Dr. Dane shared that Dr. McLean had left her with some notes. So it doesn't say that Dr. McLean stated. And I, I don't know if she's mentioned anywhere else of ha as having said anything. Because we would have to, if, if it says Dr. McLean stated or then we would need to clarify that she wasn't there and that she but well whatever I, she's comfortable with. I would with. like to defer to what Dr. McLean is comfortable with and I think if she explained the issue in the August meeting minutes then it should be reflected in the June minutes to refer to that section of the August meeting minutes. Can we do that? Can we can can we say please see um, the August whatever uh, minutes um, to, well, it's, it's not revised to. Um, it's, it's possible to include in this motion a motion to so amend the prior meeting minutes to reflect the parenthetical remark because it's being inserted to clarify something that's in the prior record, but it is being approved as part of the process for approving um, this particular Set of minutes. Okay, I still move then. What, what, was it your motion? Was it your motion? Your motion? Okay. Oh, that's is your motion. Yeah, I guess. No, it's to approve it. So you have yeah. to move to it. You have to do it. So just include just include right. this suggestion. Again. It would be an amendment, the amendment to the pending motion to amend those prior minutes to reflect in the form of a parenthetical that, that uh, the issue uh, has been addressed in later minutes do correct it. Yes. Thank you. Is there more discussion? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure because I, um, I don't want to say that it was Corrected. Uh, I mean, because there was a there was a Where statement of clarification made, um, but but the August the June fifth minutes were correct. They uh, they re accurately reflect what Dr. Dane said. It's just that Dr. Dane didn't. Um, yeah, but what's the harm in just adding an addendum? Adding the addendum there. I think Mr. Pulido's concern was the use of the word correct. Um, instead of something like clarify or amend? Or, yeah, well, well, I like I prefer the word clarify. That you know the the um, this you know Dr. Um, McLean clarified her statements at the August 9th or whatever date it was um, meeting. Please see minutes of that meeting for something you know yeah. whatever. But but just um, I I don't I don't want there to be a perception that the minutes themselves are incorrect because if they were incorrect we would need to change it right there. So the word clarify. Yes. So in the recommended language to substitute the word clarify instead of correct. Okay. Otherwise it would be the same. Yes. Yes. I will second that. Is there any more discussion? Is there any public comment? Can we call for the vote? Azalino, yes. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Abstain. Rufino? Yes. And Gordon is absent. Okay. We're going to skip ahead for just a minute to number 22, R proposed 2019 board meeting schedule. So. You can look at the calendar. Um, there are board meetings we need to schedule, and then as previously discussed, we would like to do a teleconference board meeting 
sometime before the end of the year. Actually, it should be sometime very quickly. So why don't we um, try to schedule the teleconference first, keeping in mind that there needs to be a 10-day meeting notice. I assume it will be in December. Ah. Okay. Can it be the last? Can it be the last week in November? This year, you're talking? Yeah, we're talking. It's a teleconference uh, meeting for, for, for some. It's going to be for closed, closed session. session items that we didn't finish. Oh, I see. So we're going to open and close. Yeah, it's going to be closed session. So I know some of you have preference on dates. Is it Tuesdays or Thursdays still the preferred date for us? I'm fine if it's a teleconference. It's fine. I mean, the, the 27th would be great. If, uh, so that week, the 27th or the 29th would work. Actually, I prefer the 27th. 27th is good with me. Okay. 27th. Can can't, Corey can't do the 27th. Oh, you can't. Not even for like an hour teleconference. I don't know what time my previous event is going to be over with, but I can probably do it like like one o'clock or 12, 12:30, 1 o'clock. Or do you want to do it later in the afternoon? I could do one o'clock on the twenty seventh. I mean it shouldn't take that long, right? I could do one o'clock too. I'm flexible. That should be okay. One thirty, I would prefer like I don't know. Could you do that afternoon? If I if if it's at one thirty, I'd have to do the two thirty. Oh, we should be able to wrap it up on the house. Then go ahead and plan them there. What one o'clock? Okay. It sounds like it's better for you, right? Yeah, it is, but I can do it. One, one o'clock on the 27th. I mean, I can do it. I just have to ask a question. No, I'm Okay, so one o'clock on the 27th, we'd like to have a teleconference. So the 27th at? One o'clock. Thank you. You'll be able, are you going to send out notice on that? And then um, we need to have a, a meeting in January. Well, for purposes of notice, though, you want to mirror the closed session item in 4C. Yes. yes. Thank you. And so in January, can we... Do we have to go to Southern Cali? Can we do it in Sacramento? Uh, I do. I know we have to have two down, two up, but do we have to alternate? It depends on the date. Like the eight, it's a Tuesday. It will be perfect in Sacramento. <laughs> the day after the inauguration, so Frank can stay over. We'll, we we can keep the balloons from the administration. We can Sacramento. And Maybe, who knows, maybe somebody can even. I'm available on the 8th. I, I think at different times we discussed it, but Thursday usually works the best. I don't know if that's changed. So. Well, some people, Tuesdays work, some people, I mean, Thursdays works the best for me, but I don't know how. But let me ask you a practical question. Where can we be? It, do you, what do you think the probability of the capital being available um, the day after the inauguration? Yeah. We typically hold it at DCA headquarters, so we haven't held a meeting at Capitol due to um, video. Yeah, we're not able to live, live webcast from the um, Capitol. Yeah, I prefer the Capitol, and I don't know how many people are watching the live webcast, but I'd, I'd suggest the board to weigh in on that. Just so just for you guys' consideration, the 10, I think was thrown out up there, the 10 would work as well. Sacramento. Either day is fine. What do you guys think um, about the Capitol versus uh, DCA office? I, I guess it comes down to, do you think it's more important to live Web stream or? I'm, I'm unfortunately yet to hear from somebody that watched the live stream um, live versus going back and watched it after. But I've heard from people, but I mean, granted, doesn't mean that lots of people are watching it. This is the only board, by the way, that we have this live stream. The other boards that I serve on it, there's no live stream. There is no recording, period. 
Yeah, I mean, the live stream doesn't really give anybody any advantage. I would think most people. Okay, so the only other concern is that we don't know about the availability. So I say if you guys want to do that, I think we've just got confirmation that um, if the room is available, that we could record it and then put it on the website or on the website later. And should that not be available, DCA is always going to be up. Okay, yeah, just as a practical matter for most <coughs> licensees, uh, the benefit of having it recorded is we could watch it at night or on a weekend or something of the sort. I don't think most people are taking time out of their day from seeing patients to watch a live webcast, but. So the 8th or the 10th, which does, do you guys, are you available on more than both of those days? I prefer the 8th. Okay, 8th, everybody. Uh, do you know, have any ideas on inauguration on a day? Is it a morning thing, an afternoon thing? Well, it's going to be all day. The oath will be taken uh, during the day and then there's going to be a ton of stuff going on. In okay. I'd say the 8th would be better than. Yeah, because we'll be already in Sacramento. That's why I'm thinking. Are you available, Dr. McClain? Or Frank, I'm going to say. Just for you, Frank. Oh, I'll do this very well. Okay. I mean,. Depend, just an FYI, depending on the timing of um, when legislation that we may be tracking or taking a position on is going to be heard in committee, it's hard to predict how those are going to fall around um, board meetings. But we may have to call one or more special meetings to take a position on legislation so we can testify. Um, yeah, that's fine. So um, just um, a little request, um, since we are doing it on that Tuesday, if there's possible to start at 9.30. 9.30 would work, even 10, because at 9.40. Because I would probably be flying in that morning, yeah. and I don't want to, I don't want to be late because of flights, because flights are usually either 7 or too late. And and just be mindful that we're at the Capitol, we can't go past 5 o'clock. So that's something also to be mindful. Yeah, so starting later is actually pro problematic. And then also, um, just as an aside from, from the actual time in the meeting, for the current board um, officers, availability to approve the agenda. So that's the last week of December, and so that, and that's right around Christmas. So. I will be available. I, just I will be on it. Send a little ribbon with it, and I'll make it happen. Um, I, I mean, with all the respect, I think if changing it to 9.30, I don't think, or even 10, because the agenda, I don't think it's going to be. Typically, that meeting is election officers. I mean, it's a quick meeting, as I recall, for the past six years. It's been real quick. Everybody will be Five fasting minutes. on the first yeah. week, right? So we won't have to eat so I, don't, I, don't know. I, I guess the point I'm making is I'm totally okay with 9.30 or even 10 o'clock. Okay. Um, to accommodate Dr. McLean. I don't think it's a big deal to be honest. Half hour makes a big difference for her. It may, it may or may not. I mean, it just okay. all depends on lights and that sort of thing. I was just trying to allot for that. Uh, I, we don't have to decide the time yeah. right now. Yes. So we can, as it gets closer, we can look at what's on the agenda and what flights are available and then plan accordingly. Yeah. So it sounds like everybody's flexible on the time. I, I, I just have a point of clarification for Mr. Rapino. Yeah. So you just said about typically what we do as far as that January meeting. So I'm not quite sure of your expectations for the meeting. So are you expecting just 
to do the election of officers in January, and then we have a subsequent full board meeting in February, or because if you guys are flying down, we're okay. going to have a full board meeting. Yeah. yeah. Usually yes. We're going to have a full board meeting. I would suggest we do everything we can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm fine with that. I'm just talking from past experience. It's been always a quick meeting. Even the last year was, we were out of there by noon. Last year, all we did was election of officers so in January, and yeah. we had the full meeting in February. So, um, so that's the thing. It won't necessarily be as quick. Well, I'm fine with either way. I'm yeah, let's just determine the time. You guys yeah, could speak to fine. Dr. Can, McLean yeah, we can individually when she looks at flights. Does April 11th work for people? Now, if we do... No, uh, April 11th, that would not work. That week would not work at all for me. I don't know why. I haven't... It was suggested a recommendation to dates in January, May, August, and October. So we... Well, last year we did February for a full board meeting, so we bumped it to May. So if we're doing January, um, it it'll... Just, that information is current with the staff's recommendations as far as scheduling the meeting. But it's awards well on we can do May. I, I don't care. It, yeah, April is a bad month for me, and and I looked at the, you know, and I was prepared. I'm prepared to do it in May. I have several. What are your in dates May. in May, Frank? Uh, well, going with bad, you know, two two Thursdays and Tuesdays because that's what's been kind of a yes. so like starting with the first Thursday, May second, would work, or uh, May sixth and seventh, seven. Would work for 23rd. The 7th will not work for you, Frank. I'll let you know why after. The there's a function there. Eight. There's a function then. Okay. And then I got May 21st for the people that like Tuesdays or 23rd. How about May 2nd? Does that work for Which one? May 2nd. May 2nd yeah. works, yeah. yes. I, I, that work for everyone else? That's fine. That's going to be in Southern California. Is that, that's in Southern California? Yes. So, by the way, May 2nd, um, did we, Southern California just could be LA, or, uh, or are we going to go back to the colleges, or we like to? Yeah. Because if we can, I think we should. Yeah. I, I think it adds so much more. If it's available. So, May 2nd, is that where we're looking at? Yes. So, what was the next month? You were, were you planning July? Well, August was the next month. August. Okay. I'm going by the suggestion. That's right. That's right. If that's what you're, do you have uh, days in July? Uh, I mean, in August. Sure. Uh, five. I mean, sorry, the six Tuesday is again six and eight, thirteen and fifteen. Twenty-second. Uh, so the August meeting, what, would, would that be back in Northern California? Yes. Or uh, the end of August. So August, I've got a lot of flexibility. Just to answer your question, um, we we typically alternate um, Northern Southern California, but we're not um, bound by that. We can even if we say we're going to have the August meeting in Southern California, if um, as we're approaching that meeting, for some reason we decide we should have it up north, um, we can do that. Sure. The, it, it, we're not even bound by the dates. These are we're just trying to um, you know, find dates while everybody's together, sure. find dates that work for everybody. But we can we can move things around if necessary. And I think if we're going to have them at the schools, then we need to know what their schedules like too. Yeah. If they're which leads me to my next comment. I in the past. Um, few minutes have gotten two um, emails from individuals who are watching this meeting as we speak. One of them is a dean at a college, and the other one is uh, wonderful. <laughs> as a practitioner, who are those anonymous people? Yeah. They, they are. Um, they are <laughs> Kendra Holloway and Jonathan Egan. So, um, thank you, those of you who are watching. And <laughs> my email address is robert.pulio at dca.ca.gov. So, anybody else? Watching, let, let us know. <laughs> so they're texting you, Robert, welcoming us to have yeah, our vote. They, they want you to know how much they love um, being able to watch the, the meeting live. 
So August. while we have Jonathan Egan watching us, why don't we see if the dates in May work well for them, if it's <laughs> on a break. Jonathan, if you're still there, can you let me know? <laughs> Make sure the dates in May work, because if they're on a break, we may want to modify that. And I think it would be helpful if we get the same. Does August 29th work for people? Jonathan just noticed that the app says that he can. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
Do you, do you know what you I'm sorry, your meeting, Don, was when? of October in San Diego? Can't do that, unfortunately. Um, okay, so. How about the 18th? Yeah, that works. I mean. Well, not if I don't think we need. Staff is going to be a yeah. If we have uh, oh, information, right. if we have an exhibitor hall table, then staff's going to be at that. What what days work for you? Uh, the 18th, 24th. Oh, the 18th, 24th. Let's Sacramento or 24th. 24th is on. Sorry, 24th. No, the 24th doesn't work for you, sir? It'll work. The 29th is better, but that's okay if we have to do the 24th. Okay. So October 24th? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's Northern California? Yes. It's in Northern California? Yes. Did you say that about the last one? Well, typically it's the, the Bay Area. Not Sacramento. Going back to May, um, SCU doesn't start its summer session until um, May 6th, so um, the school would be on break in the second. We would need to move the um, meeting later in May if we wanted to be there while it was in session. Okay. So anybody, I don't remember what people said about, you weren't available on the 9th, right, Frank? Which one? May 9th um, or May 16th. No, May 16 would definitely not work. My son is been. What about the no, May 9th would not work either. How about the 7th or the 14th? 7th doesn't seventh work. Oh, yeah, 7th doesn't work. 7th doesn't work. Yeah. That's right, you said that. The 14th would work. No, 14th would not work. 23rd? Well, we start getting close once yeah, again. Well, the holiday. 27th is the holiday. Any days in May work for you? 21st or 23rd, that would work. The 23rd. Well, we can do 22nd. 22nd if you want to do it. So 21st, 22nd, or 23rd. 21st. Or 24th even, it doesn't matter. Does the 21st work for you, Dr. Uh, yeah. Okay. Does the 21st work for everyone else? Yeah, we could do that. It's going to be in L.A., right? It's going to be at yeah, SCU. SCU. SCU, yeah, that's what... And we did, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of catch that early flight. 20, did we get confirmation from you, Doctor? Yes. The, and you were 21st, you said? 21st? Okay. All right, so instead of the second, it'll be the 21st. Okay. Thank okay. God we have somebody watching this meeting. <laughs> Apparently there's six people online right now. Um, yeah, I'm assuming it's good. Dr. Dane, can you read off the date? Yeah, 1127 for the teleconference, January 8th, May 21st, July 25th, and October 24th. I just want to give everybody a reminder I'm fine because I'm driving home, but we have a couple people need to catch up yeah, the shuttle in an hour or so. Go. That's why we moved that up. So, we are going to get back into the order of the agenda. Number 18, review discussion and possible action regarding SB 1448. Mm. Uh, let's see.
what was this, 18, you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay, 1448. Um, Probation status disclosure. Okay, yeah, and this um, 1448 by Senator Hill, um, this would require um, specified healing arts um, professions, including chiropractic, um, for licensees who were on probation to disclose that fact um, verbally and in writing to their patients and to have the patient um, sign a, a form um, indicating that they've been informed that the licensee is on uh, probation. And um, there are certain exemptions for emergency situations, but uh, the, uh, the, it would have to be for existing patients, the notification would have to be before their next visit after the bill goes into effect. For new patients, they'd have to be notified before their first visit, and they'd have to be provided with um, certain information about the, um, about the probation and the violations that led to it. And do we know if DCA or anybody's providing a standardized form for all practitioners? There will be. That's something that's being, I'm going to be participating in a uh, meeting in the coming weeks um, discussing the logistics of this, and I'm sure DCA's legal office. That's for 2130. Oh, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's a different bill. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I'm not aware of, of working the group on this particular issue, but the um, bill itself is fairly prescriptive, and so it may be possible uh, just to use the language of the bill to uh, construct the form. Sure. Uh, and I'm not sure if it uh, impacts any existing regulations. Um, I think normally, this is handled as a term and condition of probation. So it wouldn't require any sort of a repeal or amendment of existing regulation. Yeah, we, we've been doing this regularly, but I'm just curious, do you have any insight on why or how this passed now, whereas last time it was rejected or? They have, the bill has been um, revised somewhat from what it was last okay. year. And I think some of the opposition that was based on some of the prior provisions um, lightened. I, I think there's, there were still concerns by some professions, but um, but I, I think some of the concerns were addressed with amendments, and that's okay. why it made it through this year. Great. Very timely. Just so, to be clear, that's effective July 1, 2019. Okay. Okay. Then on to um, SB 1480 professions and vocations. Um, this is the bill that contained our fee increase, uh, or actually our new fee schedule. So as we've been discussing for quite some time, um, we did a fee audit and um, identified for all of the fees we charge uh, what the appropriate amount would be. I'm sorry? Um, what the appropriate amount should be. So, um, so that bill did pass and get signed by the governor. So effective January 1, um, there'll be there's, there's a memo included that um, lists all of the fees and what they will be. The renewal fee will be $313 um, for this current year that we're in. They, there was a temporary increase from the prior 250 to 300 And now the, um, the fee that came out of the audit is 313 So um, from, 20, uh, from January 1 ongoing, we'll be charging a 313 renewal fee. And all of our other fees have been adjusted based on the actual cost of providing the service. And that will require, we, we won't have to do a reg to implement the fee increase, but we will want to do a reg to, um, to capture these in the regulations, these new fees. And, um, and then um, for 21 agenda, no, agenda item 20, I'm sorry. If you refer to your supplemental handout, we have the information on there. Yep, there's, um, so in that blue folder, I'll get it. Thank you. Um, I don't know where it is. Um, but 2138 um, modified uh, some of the, um, provisions related to denial or discipline or revocation of a license um, related to criminal um, criminal convictions and uh, what the board can and can't consider um, uh, related to a, a prior criminal conviction. And um, it will, for, for 
prior arrests or convictions, we won't know, um, we won't be able to look at convictions that occurred more than seven years ago. Um, there's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the thing, I'm sorry, I need to refer to it. Um, the, the memo, I, oh, thank you, yeah. So, um, so a statute, right? Um, yeah, it's it's you know a lot of the a lot of the changes to this were subtle, um, you know as far as um, if you know, the um, we'll we'll have to be a little more. Um, sorry, can you take this, Marcus? On yeah. yeah. Um, so if you refer to the document, I bolded all the relevant at a high level the requirements that are placed on the board, and then I provided the subsequent details. So at a high level, they define what a conviction is, um, and then it authorizes the board to deny an application based on certain criteria, and that's included. Um, one of the things that was contentious initially was um, they didn't initially include a, a denial criteria based on the conviction of a crime, a sex-related crime, and so that was a huge concern, but they actually amended that into the bill, which is huge. Like, we should be, if someone, has to register the tier one or two, tier two sex offender. We now have the ability to deny based on that. Um, and then also 2138, um, and they provide criteria that prohibits us from denying the license. Um, and so it's based on certain criteria. And so that's important for us. It also um, provides um, criteria for staff on our end when we're reviewing an application. It provides criteria that we have to use to deny a license. Um, then it requires us to, um, to post that criteria that's developed on the board's website. Um, and then it also requires us to, like, report, um, to collect data related to our actions on this area. And then also it requires us to put this information on our website. So is there going to have to be a regulation? Developed there, yeah, there will. We, we will need to modify our regs. We, we still have to, because some of this um, will we'll need to work with the legal office and, um, and determine how we will actually make some of these determinations. Um, and, but it, it will require a little more legwork on our part when we're reviewing applications. And uh, because there's, there's concern out there among um, uh, what, um, advocate groups that um, people who are otherwise qualified or being denied an ability to um, earn a living or practice the profession for which they were educated based on old violations um, or violations that, um, convictions. It, um, convictions, I'm sorry, uh, convictions that you know, are being subjectively determined to, um, to be related to the profession at hand. Um, and we and a lot of the other boards, um, you know, did weigh in on this and, uh, you know, because we do, we have to take these on a case-by-case -case basis and we do consider these things very carefully and the, the age of the, um, the age of the conviction and, you know, any mitigating information, we already do that. This, this bill um, somewhat codifies some of those things that boards are already doing to, to ensure that somebody's not being denied a, a license unnecessarily. So, um, so we'll have to make some adjustments. We're still going to have to um, figure out some of the details, but we will be doing a regulation to implement this. And is there a possibility that since this is going to affect yes. many, many boards that they're all going to use the same language and so um, it won't be so labor intensive? For yeah, we all have, board? because we all have our own acts and regulations and, you know, there's, um, we have to go in and amend the provisions of our acts, our respective acts and regulations individually, or regulations in this case. They, um, we won't be able to do just one package, but there, um, we will, this is the bill that I was referring to that I'm going to be participating in a meeting. So we'll determine the, the common denominators and things that we can mirror, you know, from board to board. And then some things we may have to craft specifically for our board depending on, you know, the way our regulation is structured or the way a certain provision is worded. So. And I guess I was just hoping that there could be common language so that OAO 
get these things through a little faster. Yeah, hopefully for some of those, you know, for the, the statement of economic interest and for, um, you know, for the necessity and so on, um, hopefully some of those things we can streamline and use the same because this all is stemming from this legislation. So um, we'll, we'll have updates on this in the coming months. And two things I'd like to mention. The law becomes effective in July of 2020. So there is built-in time for any regulatory or rulemaking processes. In addition, uh, the thought is that many of the changes might be <coughs> accomplished through what's called a Section 100 change. It doesn't require a full rulemaking. Uh, so that's been um, examined at this point in time. application for licensure and I know we were just talking about it um, and it's been removed from our list however we'll be placed back on it eventually just because of the, re um, the revisions that will be made um, but I want to let you know that it went into effect October 1st of 2018 and um, it's been posted to the website along with supporting documentation um, and so that's the update for that then moving on to... Can I ask a question? I'm yeah. confused. It, it went into effect, but it's still going to be back on the list for revisions? Well, I'm only saying that because we were just talking about Bill a, um, AB 2138, which will have to amend our current uh, application. So eventually, got in it. July now 2020... I okay, I got it. All right. That's Hopefully it'll be a pretty that. quick yeah. web package since we're only amending one thing, not yes. overhauling the whole application. Right. Okay. So That's continue. only why I, Thank you. I made that comment. <laughs> so, for example, if the existing application phrases a question in a way that is inconsistent with the new language, mm -hmm. um, the thought is it might be possible to uh, make that sort of change through the streamlined Section 100 process. It would not be as, as um, time intensive, labor intensive. Okay. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Um, the CPEI regulation is currently being reviewed and it's with our legal counsel. And um, if he has any recommendations or revisions, then it will circle back to the board and um, hope, hoping to get an approval. And then if, when that happens, then it will be noticed. So that's where we're at right now with that regulation. What, well, once, once we get the go ahead from legal counsel, then it would be it would come back to the board to um, to vote to move forward with the rulemaking process. So, yeah. um, the uh, disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards. So that's currently being reviewed by our retired annuitant, and um, staff is uh, working on updating language uh, for the different sections in the disciplinary guidelines. And um, it is my understanding that the, uh, uh, let's say, Substance Abusing or Abusive abuse Committee has recently reviewed um, uh, this, uh, the uniform standards related to SB 1441. And I believe that there has not been any um, substantive change to it. So uh, this will allow us to move forward uh, with this regulation, and we shouldn't really expect any major obstacles with this. Um, so moving on to Group B, um, at the board's request, um, we staff have prioritized um, or reprioritized uh, some regulations so um, as you can see, the curriculum requirements and uh, C requirements have been moved up um, here on this list. Um, as far as the curriculum requirements, the newly appointed uh, curriculum committee has been working on making revisions um, to the curriculum uh, requirements 
along with staff and myself. Um, and we're looking to revise the language. Uh, so once that's done, that will be brought forward to the board. Uh, the C requirements, um, so the licensing committee is currently working on C requirements and um, let's see. if there's any um, proposed, um, you know, revisions or anything like that, that will be also uh, referred to you so you can review it and um, give some feedback um, on it. The delegation of authority to the Assistant Executive Officer Regulation is currently uh, with our legal counsel, and um, he's reviewing it at this time, and if there's any revisions, um, it will be brought forward to the board. And, and then it will be noticed. I have a quick question mm -hmm. on that one. Just out of a procedural question, do we need to do that um, for every assistant executive officer? I'm sorry, what's that? The delegation? Uh, no, that's that would um, we just we don't have any delegation authority in our regulation now, so we would be adding it, and then it would it would Correct. be there, and it would apply to any assistant EO going forward. I don't know why I thought we submitted that when Linda was around. We started working on it. Back then, and, and still working in the um, yeah, we have the language, um, so it's right. it's just a matter of moving the, the reg through the process. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, as far as group C, uh, we have not started um, developing the uh, regulation for those two. Uh, the chiropractic records retention and uh, amending or repealing. Uh, the successful examination we have not started. But uh, we're right now giving priority to the curriculum and the CE regulations. Any? I know we had, thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, I had brought up a question regarding the naming of the corporations and was that that we needed to have regulation there or Ken, I know you did some research on that. At this point, the statute is clear what the requirement is, and so it would require uh, an amendment to the um, statute in order to make that change. So I would recommend that it get referred to the appropriate committee for further study. Um, so you're, you're talking about um, just a naming for corporations? Yeah, but I, I and I don't recall that it's um, 1,000 something. They, um, yeah, the code section. 1,001 or 1,002. Oh, yeah, so, um, and the proposal was to repeal it. Um, so, so you don't see any issue with us repealing, repealing that section of the BMP code? Being, I'm losing my ability to talk. The BMP code. Um, well, it deals with the ability of um, chiropractors to form a professional corporation. and. Part of it does limit the naming of it. And so you would want to retain that ability to have a chiropractic corporation, but remove the restriction on the naming of the corporation. Uh, but that would require an amendment to the existing code section, which is Business and Professions Code Section 1054. Okay. And how would we go about that amendment? At the moment. It would be through a um, proposed legislation. You'd have to have a bill sponsor. I have a quick observation. Good question on that too. Does the, uh, for council, does the code section speaks to the type of uh, corporation, whether it's an LLC? No. Not, not, not that I'm no. aware of. It, it's just specifically each corporation. With specifically corporation. Professional corporation. Professional corporation would be. As long as it's registered with Secretary of State, can be C, can be S, but um, it does clearly define naming abilities. Yeah. Any other discussion? Well, I'd like to see what we need to do to start moving that forward. Um, 
I got another quick question. Sure. Real quick will be for staff, but I think I heard them saying that the uh, the record retention and the disposition of patient records has been um, in the priority is sort of the last. I, I get that Correct. part. But we are not dropping that totally. No, no, not at all. We just haven't really um, started developing the package because we focus our priority on CE um, the requirements, also curriculum requirements, and obviously the legislative so, um, mandated regulations as well. CPI. We can just repeal that. And uh, the disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards. But no, we will we'll focus on that as well. Okay. Thank you. Just um, going back to um, the chiropractic corporation name, um, it's, it's section 1054, it's very brief, so I'll read it. It states, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the name of a chiropractic corporation and any name or names under which it may be rendering professional services shall contain the name or the last name of one or more of the present prospective or former shareholders and shall include the word chiropractic and the word corporation or wording or abbreviations denoting corporate existence. So that's the whole section. And so the proposal on the table would be to uh, repeal that section. And legal counsel isn't aware of any, um, any overarching law that um, re would require us to impose this. I, I thought it might be part of the, um, the Knox Keen Professional Corporation Act um, that there may be some provision in there, but um, there doesn't appear to be anything that would um, prevent us from doing this. So if the board wants to, and I don't recall if we voted it on this at a prior meeting or we just discussed it. So I'm sorry. Okay, so I, I think it would be appropriate then for the board to vote to. Um, I'll make the section, and then and then we'll we'll approach the legislature and try to find um, a legislator to carry the bill. Yeah, I'll make a motion to repeal um, section yeah. section ten fifty four of the BNP code. Of BNP. Yeah. We've already it's already been voted on. We voted on it. Oh. oh, we did vote on it. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So okay. So right. so the, we're the corporation is that, but then the DBA. A lot of contractors get confused on. About time. DBA corporation. Well, this is repealing so that so we're, well, we're in line with all other healthcare practitioners and regards to corporate. Well, there um, we just some professions require um, all licensees to file uh, a fictitious business name permit for any name they're using other than their actual name and the name of their profession. So if um, if I or say Dr. Lickman, if um, if you're using a name other than Dr. Corey Lickman, D.C., or court, um, chiropractic, um, you would, you know, you're, because I believe your name of your practice is Solano Beach. And sports Yeah, so, um, so with some professions, um, you would be required to register that name with the board so they would have a record um, of who's doing business under a name other than their um, corporation. Well, technically, okay. you should have a corporation and a DBA, according to the statute. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Confusion. That's what a lot of coverage is confused. Right. Well. Any other? Well. So we don't have to vote. We don't have to call for a vote. Okay. So who will move this forward with the legislator? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any public comment? Items, it's about items on the agenda. On the agenda? Yeah, no, no it's okay. Yeah. Come out, because the next thing I'm going to say is items not on the agenda. <laughs> uh, Lori Eisenberg. And uh, this is Life West. Life yeah. Chiropractic College West. Um, so a colleague of mine actually asked me to raise this, uh, which is regarding the teleconferences that would it be possible to use a, a more accessible technology, something online, uh, for meetings so that more people can participate rather than doing the conference call at predetermined locations? We've explored that and we haven't found anything that was going to be uh, better or easier to use. And I don't know if there's anything new, we, but we're open to suggestions. Well, well, I think we'll have to, because I know um, most boards um, 
are in the same boat. We are. Uh, I think there. I think medical board recently started using uh, for board meetings. I don't know about for committee meetings, but for board meetings, they started using uh, interactive technology uh, so that people could participate remotely um, in the meeting through an operator or something. So we can look into that um, for board meetings. I don't know how practical it would be for committee meetings, we'd have to look at the expense and uh, various other things. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to look into that. If, um. It was in regard to committee meetings, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment for items not on the agenda? Right. Is there any future agenda items? No? I got one. Yeah. So I implied it earlier. Um, it essentially, it's closing of the nomination process of board officers. What do I want it agendized. Oh. Just to be clear, Mr. Pena, you want it to be closing nominations at the last meeting of the year? Correct. Or when the nomination occurs. So. It is specified that the process, at least is now, it's the last meeting of the year. Yes. Yeah. Any other agenda items? Okay. Meeting is adjourned. All right. Thank you. You guys, did you click that?